Welcome back to Sunday Night Baseball from Jacobs Field in Cleveland. Sunday Night Baseball is also available nationwide on the ESPN radio network. Now coming up tonight, Aaron Seeley will explain his devastating curveball. And Rick Sutcliffe has further analysis. And Edgar Martinez explains why Ichiro's unusual swing is so effective. And tonight we continue with the Sunday Night Baseball exclusive, the K Zone, creating a 3D virtual strike zone. Crosshairs activate to where the pitch enters the zone, demonstrating the strategy between pitcher and batter. And that's all coming up tonight on Sunday Night Baseball, as well as updates throughout the night of the Cubs Dodgers game airing over on ESPN2. And here's the next tell batting order for the Seattle Mariners, turned in by manager Lou Pinella with Ichiro at the top of the order, then McLemore, and uh, then the, the two all pros. Yeah, the three and four guys, Lou Pinella says he can be an American League manager and sit back and watch, but with everybody else, he says, I try to put the game in motion. We try to stay away from the ground ball double play, create RBI opportunities for those two guys in the heart of the lineup. And speaking of RBIs, the leading RBI producer, Brett Boone, is not in the lineup, just getting a, a night off for the first time in two and a half months. And there's veteran Dave Berba, who is nine and eight. But look at that ERA. He has struggled. Yeah. You know, he was eight and two on June the 9th. So that tells you how things have gone for Dave Berba since then. But he's been terrific in the second half throughout his career. Well over 500 as a second half pitcher. The Indians are hoping for the same. And we get started. The first pitch just off the outside to Ichiro. Ichiro. Four hits in 10 at bats in this series. 332 batting average. And that again misses. So the count is 2 0. Oh. Ichiro does not often walk, only 19 walks all year. And that is in there for a cold strike. Two balls and a strike to count. Ichiro doesn't get many walks because he's always getting hits. He has 160 base hits. Number one in all of Major League Baseball. Got the inside corner. Two and two the count. Mike Cameron telling me before the game that each row is just so in control of his emotions. Very few peaks and valleys. That's foul on the third base side. Still two balls, two strikes. A beautiful night here in Cleveland near the shores of Lake Erie. 78 degrees, the game time temperature. Temperatures got up near 90 degrees on the lakefront today. Two two count. Goes to the inside. Strike three call. Bourbon knew on the previous pitch when Ichiro was able to control the fastball just off the outside corner. There's got to be a hole in there somewhere. Well, he found it on the inside part of the plate. He caught the top of the K zone and picks up a very big out. When you consider the guy he got out is leading the league in run scored. Ichiro, who was always up there hacking, did not hack there and got called out. Almost a perfect pitch from Burba's standpoint as Mark McLemore takes a strike. And you saw the emotion part that Cameron was talking about with Ichiro. He struck out, no big deal. Come back, put the bat in the rack, set his helmet down, and grabs a seat. Cameron says that Ichiro acts the same way whether he makes an out or he hits a home run. Just knows how to play the game of baseball. That is a, a temperament that you'll see up and down this Seattle ball club. Going to the count to Mark McLemore, just off the outside. Now McLemore is hitting 294. He's got a 385 on base average, 29 stolen bases. Tonight he's at second base with Red Boone getting the night off. There's a splitter and he swung it. Strike three. Tried to check, couldn't do it. Take a look defensively what's behind Dave Berber and you see a lot of gold gloves up the middle four in center field for Kenny Lofton 17 the second base and shortstop position more than any other double play combination in the history of baseball and as you know well know John they're not done yet there's more gold to come yeah. for those two guys two of the best to ever play those positions defensively here is Edgar Martinez. Edgar, who got injured on a Sunday night game three weeks ago in Seattle. He pulled the quadricep muscle in his leg in an interleague game against the Arizona Diamondbacks. He just got back this weekend. I mean, they missed him greatly when he first departed. At least at first, they missed him. 
Then all of a sudden, the guys that they were rotating at DH all got hot, and uh, the production continued. Off the outside, one ball, one strike. Edgar hitting 297, 14 homers, 70 batted in. Gets a lot of walks. He's on base all the time. I think the only guy that Seattle could not replace is their manager, Lou Pinella. That's foul. If Sasaki goes down in the bullpen, well, you've got Nelson and Arthur Rhodes to close with. You give the league leader in RBIs the night off tonight, no big deal, right? Brett Boone trying to talk Lou Pinella into putting him into the lineup, saying that our ratings tonight would go way down when people found out he wasn't playing. Yeah, we laughed when we heard him say that, but you notice we didn't mention it right away. <laughs> down on the way to Edgar. Two and two the count. Now the Cleveland Indians have lost six out of seven. They fell out of first place this weekend. And they come into play tonight knowing that the Minnesota Twins lost their game. Cleveland was a game and a half back when the night began. And it's too long with a fastball. Full count to Edgar Martinez. Sometimes with Edgar, and the same with John Olerud who's on deck, you might as well just set the count at three and two before they walk up there. I mean, they get the deep count almost every time. Two down, nobody on. There's Freiman. Edgar's still not running at peak efficiency. So a great first inning for Berba on a night when the Cleveland Indians need him to be great. Cleveland coming up. MLB at Home is presented by Scott's, who knows that some of the best games are played in the backyard. Scott's, grow more good. ESPN Sunday Night Baseball. Tonight from the Jake. Jacobs Field in downtown Cleveland. Here's the next tail batting order for the home team turned in by manager Charlie Manuel and you've got those familiar names at the top although Kenny Lofton and Omar Vizcal have not been getting on base with much frequency Roberto Alomar meanwhile having a great year and then you got the all the sluggers behind him. Yeah, and Most people in baseball will tell you that's the most dangerous heart of any lineup in all of baseball having Gonzalez back in there is the big bopper that's why he hits cleanup the protection those guys provide and the fact that all of them John are terrific hitters with runners in scoring position as well. And Aaron Seeley on the mound for the Mariners we saw him pitch a two hit shutout against Arizona of the National League three weeks ago and you see his numbers right there. In many ways, he's having his best year. What a pitcher he has been. 12 wins on the year, the four seam fastball. That two seam fastball, we have seen a lot more of this year. Watch for the movement going away from the left handed hitter. The curveball is his out pitch when he goes for the strikeout. That's the one. And more changes. Kenny okay, Lofton up the middle, base hit. Lofton, who is having his worst year. Hitting only 238, only a 300 on base percentage, not stealing many bases. The defense behind Aaron Seeley, it starts with Mark McLemore for manager Lou Pinella. He said he's a symbol of everything that's good about this club. He's played second, he's played short, he's played third, he's played the outfield, and he's played all of them well. He hits second in the lineup that sets the table for everybody else. It just creates opportunities for people to score runs and for other people to get into the lineup playing. Now Omar Vizquel, one ball and no strikes. Vizquel also struggling, 265 average, but the on-base average only 334. Just a couple of years ago, both Lofton and Vizquel had on-base percentages up around 380, 390, 400. Then you had Roberto Alomar in the same mode, but also hitting some power. I mean, their first three guys in the lineup were the most imposing of any first three in any lineup, but they have not been able to replicate that this year. Lofton only 11 steals for the whole year, and he's been thrown out eight times. And Lofton is back. By the same token, if they could start making things happen at the top again, and they keep, are able to keep Gonzalez in the lineup, keep Burks in the lineup. I mean, then they should be able to score huge numbers of runs again. Gonzalez had missed the last eight days before tonight. Pitch out, but Austin was not run. Two and zero the count. Even though Cleveland's been struggling as of late, you just don't sense a, a 
a panic in their clubhouse. They look at the scoreboard, they see Minnesota lost tonight. They really feel like they have things under control as far as their division's concerned. There's Charlie Manuel. He did have a team meeting before the game here Friday. That was called a strike on the outside, and you saw Tom Lampkin came out ready to throw, thinking that Lofton might be running. Two and one the count. Still looking for something that he can pull through that hole between the first and second baseman. A base hit to right field. Occasionally, your runner can go from first to third. A base hit to left field. Well, he's going to have to stop at second. So, early in the count, you try to get a pitch to do something like that with. Here's Lofton's lead. Olderud on the bag with it. Up fly. Shallow left. And there's Guillen in foul ground. Well, having said that, Ricky eventually goes after a pitch that was almost impossible to pull. And it was a two seam fastball. We showed the grip on it before the inning started from Aaron Seeley. The movement away that fooled Viscal. He tried to get the bat in front of home plate to pull the baseball. Watch the movement. Look at it running actually off the outside corner. Viscal, right away, you can see frustrated that he helped Aaron Seeley get himself out. And really a, a, a wasted at bat. Now Roberto Alamon, 356, four hits here yesterday. Alomar, 13 homers, 69 runs batted in. He also has 21 steals, eight triples, and win that gold glove quality second base. Lofton back to the bag at first. Well now, Vizquel did not move him over. Is the chances or do the chances of Boston trying to steal increase? Well, they would for me, particularly with Robbie Alomar at home plate and the way he can handle the bat. Seeley misses with a changeup. One ball and no strikes to Roberto Alomar. The big power hitters come up next. Juan Gonzalez on deck. And Tony then Burks. Charlie Manuel. You see Gonzalez on deck. Manuel was kind of bemoaning the, the fact. That they've only had their regular starting lineup together about five times all year. It's too hot. Too hot. Now, we're talking about Lofton running because that's been his game for years. But we're told that, I mean, he hardly runs at all right now. Hard to believe just five years ago, 1996, he stole 75 bases. It was a high percentage stolen base guy. But Lofton's still a good player, but he's not the player that he was a few years back. 2 0 the count to Roberto Alomar. Lofton not running. Alomar pops it up. Ichiro in the shallow right center. And Lofton will have to go back to first. Alomar is gone. Bobby Alomar is not a guy that gives away at bats, but he is human, and occasionally he'll miss a good pitch to hit. Look at the hips come open. He's trying to hit the ball to right field to pick up that extra base. He just missed that fastball up. I don't know that he'll see that pitch in his second or third at bat tonight. Sometimes you catch him a little bit behind velocity-wise in the first at bat of a the night. They've got the batting practice pitcher time, not the starting pitcher. Now Juan Gonzalez. That's a ball. Gonzalez had a uh, strain of his left hamstring in the second game of a doubleheader with Detroit back on July the 28th, a week or so ago. And do they miss him? Well, their record in games that he has missed this year is five wins and ten losses. And they've lost six of their last seven, all without him. It's a called strike with a breaking ball. One ball and one strike. Now, in this ballpark in particular, they've got to miss him. He's played 48 games at Jacobs Field this year and has 16 homers and 55 runs batted in. He's always hit well in this ballpark, even as a visiting player. Two down runner at first, no score. Deep in the center, but Cameron is there. It's toward the deepest part of the ballpark. And that is the inning. A leadoff walk, and Lofton never left first base. John Olerud coming up, no score. The sun setting off to the west of Lake Erie. I believe that's the west tonight. Roberto Alomar and the Cleveland Indians 
will be part of our doubleheader Wednesday on ESPN. Cleveland at Minnesota, huge for both of those contenders in the American League Central. Also over in ESPN 2, Nomar and the Red Sox out in Oakland against the Swingin' A's. And Oakland is amazingly hot right now. In fact, the whole American League West is hot right now. John Olerud takes a strike. It's not just the Seattle Mariners anymore. Oakland, Anaheim, and even Texas a great ball lately. Shallow left. And nice play by Ellis Burks. Ellis, for many years, a gold glove quality outfielder. He rarely plays the outfield any longer because of two bad knees, and he will pay a price for that catch tomorrow, but for now, Ellis Burke's showing that he can still go get it. Along with those bad knees, John, a swollen right thumb. Ellis saying before tonight's game, it's going to hurt him a lot to throw. It's also not going to help to jam that thumb into the ground, totally focused on making this play. Look at him open the palm of his hand and pull that right hand back immediately. He, he's in pain, but you wouldn't know it by the way he plays. Here's Al Martin. Center field, a late break by Lofton, and he does not get it. Martin's going to try for two. Here comes Lofton's throw. The tag. Finish. Al Martin, some of that National League style of ball that Lou Pinella's Mariners like to feature. And the I guess the uh, the late break by Lofton cost him on that one. And, and he, he got a bad read on this ball. It was hit hard, but if he breaks right immediately, he gets to the ball easily. He did not. Then he tried to dive for it. Had no chance after he had not taken the first step in the right direction. Look, he was still standing there. He actually backed up a little bit. Had he stood up and caught it on one hop, it would have been a single for Al Martin. When he dove for it, it got away. Lou Pinella telling all of his players, don't be afraid to make a difference in whether we win or lose. Be heads up about it, but be aggressive, as Martin was. Now Mike Cameron, that's a call strike on the outside to Cameron. There's the ball hit. Look at him. He's still standing there. He stopped to begin with. That was the point at which he should have stayed stopped. Catch it on the big hop, keep the double play in order. Couple of mistakes there by a guy that you normally don't see making mistakes defensively. Four gold gloves in center field for Lofton. And the curveball from Burba outside. One ball, one strike. And one thing, too, when you play the Seattle Club, you give away a base, and the Mariners have a way of beating you with that one base you gave them. I mean, they they go take those extra bases often enough as it is. With nobody out or one out, very seldom does Lou Pinella's team leave that runner standing on the base that he started on. On the other hand, Cleveland not as good of a situ situational hitting team as the Mariners, but they don't have to be because they've got so much more power. Kenny Lofton getting on to start the bottom of the first inning with a single, ended up standing at first base. Which is another difference in his game right now. Two and on the count to Mike Cameron. He was one of the Mariners All Stars and the American League All Star team. Fouling one back and out of play. Catcher Anar Diaz of the Cleveland Indians wearing mask cam tonight. And we're very pleased that he decided to do so to take us right into the action, right in the home plate area there. Cameron. 17 homers, 69 battered in, 23 steals, gold glove quality center field play. He's got Mark out there at second base right now as we look at the action from Mass Game. High in the air, left center field, deep. Burks going way back, Lofton going way back. This one is high off the wall. Burks plays the carom. Martin will score, Cameron will stop at second. And the Mariners have a one to nothing lead. Martin with another terrific job of base running. Rather than tagging, he continued to drift towards third base. And when he saw Ellis Burks turn his back to play the ball off the wall, it was easy for him to score. And Mike Cameron just simply trading places with him with the first run here. The ball elevated. That's the game plan against Dave Burba. Get a fastball up in the zone. His velocity has been down. Seattle reports that earlier in the year he was throwing in the low 90s. He's just touching the mid to upper 80s at this point in the season. Now Carlos Guillen 
He and a switch hitter, 253 average. Four homers, 43 battered in. Fastball low, but too low. One ball and no strikes. You got the big wall out there in left field. That one just kind of scraped off the wall. But there also is a rubberized warning track out there. Cameron was talking about that before the game. That he says that's one of the real hazards of playing the outfield up against that left field wall. If a ball comes off that wall and hits that warning track, it can really shoot right by it. Burks backed up lofting on that play to keep that from happening. Burks makes the grab in left center on this one. Ian retired. Cameron Holden at second base. Two down. Watching the ball carry in batting practice, you can tell by the way the wind's just slightly blowing from right field to the left field line. It will carry to left center and to left field, as that ball did that Mike Cameron hit. He's hit that same fly ball to right center field. Uh, that wind's going to hold it up. It'll be a routine play. Two down, and here is David Bell. Now, Bell kind of typifies what's going on with this ball club. I mean, his overall numbers are not very good. Only 249 batting average. 11 homers, 50 batted in. But you put a runner out there at second base, like you've got right now, and he's a whole different hitter. He has been particularly effective in spots like this. Time taken. David Bell is hitting 323 with men in scoring position. Now you talked to the Mariner players, Jamie Moore in particular, saying that David Bell has had a terrific year. He got off to a slow start, but this guy was almost an all-star. I mean, until a late rush from the fans voting for Cal Ripken Jr., that would have been David Bell's spot. Down and away. Huge contributions. Jamie Moore is saying he made a great defensive play on a ball hit hard by Kenny Lofton in Friday night's game. It helped Jamie and the Mariners win that ball game. Clutch hits, as you mentioned, with runners in scoring position. And as everybody on this Mariner team, good defense. Two balls and no strikes now. Berber falling behind Bell. A left-handed batter, Tom Lampkin, is on deck. Just typical Cleveland, even in the first inning when they went one, two, three. Dave Berber had to throw 16 pitches to get that done. Seattle working the count. It's going to take its toll. Eventually you get into the bullpen. Problem for Cleveland all year long. Their starters just averaging 5.4 innings per game. That's the fewest in all of baseball. Cleveland's uh, bullpen has been uh, overworked. There's Charles Nagy, who's come back from an injury, but he's not yet found his former stuff. He's off the outside again. Three and one the count now. With all of the new umpires in baseball today. You don't know him like you did back when it was the same rotation. Both of these veteran starters tonight trying to get home plate umpire Jeff Nelson to give something on that outer half. To this point, he has not. Three and one the count. Runner at second. Two down. And again, missing outside. So Bell draws the walk. Now he's going to have to face a left handed hitter. And as many problems as Burba has had this year. He's had even more problems against left handed hitters. Left handed hitters hitting an astounding 373 as a group against Dave Berber as he and Enar Diaz talk it over at the mound. Dave Berber's main out pitch is a split fingered fastball. It's an off speed pitch with some tumbling motion down. But to make that pitch effective, you've got to have enough velocity with your fastball to get hitters, hitters to, to cheat on it, start to swing a little sooner. He's not had that velocity to get to do it. And last night he was saying his splitter and his fastball have basically been twins. Not much difference in the radar gun. Here's Tom Lampkin, Dan Wilson, the Mariners' regular catcher, but they've been giving Dan more regular days off now than in the past. So Lampkin has been playing more often. One sinking too low, so he's behind Lampkin. Two on, two out. Ichiro is on deck. He almost puts on a calisthenic clinic in between pitches. I mean, he's constantly stretching those legs, stretching his back. Always in motion, as is Seattle's offense. 
It's a ball strike with a changeup. One ball, one strike now to Lampkin. A run is in for the Mariners. They lead one to nothing. There's Cameron who hit the double off the left center field wall to drive in Al Martin who had doubled. And Bell who walked is over at first base. Ball on a strike. And the splitter. One and two to count. Lampkin not showing the patience that the rest of the guys in his lineup have done. Here comes a splitter. You can see the grip, the tumbling action. Lampkin expanding that zone. If you continue to do that, you'll see the Dave Berba that won 15 games two years ago, 16 games last year. This time he took it. Two balls, two strikes. Well, Berba had been a a very regular winner for Cleveland. As you mentioned, I mean, the last three years, he averaged a little better than 15 wins a year. And historically, he's been at his best in the second half of the year. A lifetime record after the All Star break of 50 wins and only 24 losses. But even that has not held up for him so far this year. He is only one and two since the All Star break this year. That is in the right field, and it's a base hit. Cordova has to go back and get it. Cameron in to score over to third base is Bell, and into second is Lampkin, and it is 2 0 Seattle. Upanella before tonight's game, talking it over with his coaches, saying somebody's got to sit. He didn't know who he was going to sit out of tonight's ball game. It ended up being Brett Boone. He had an option at the catcher's position. It could have been Dan Wilson. He decided on Tom Lampkin. And once again, every single thing that Lou Pinella has done this year has paid off. So three doubles in the inning for the Mariners and a couple of near misses for Cleveland. Perhaps the most damaging was the, the first one. Kenny Lofton got a late break on the ball hit by Al Martin. And it went for a double. Another night, Boston would have picked it up immediately, turned it into an out. They would have had two down and nobody on, and maybe nothing at all would have happened in this inning. That's not the way it's going for Cleveland or Kenny Lofton right now. Ichiro, one strike to count. Blooped into left field, and that's a base hit. Bell is in, and now this is a big inning. Lampkin right behind him. It's a four run rally for the Mariners. Capped off right there by Ichiro, who has been one of the toughest outs in all of baseball. In spots like that, a 452 on, or rather, batting average with men in scoring position. The best average in the American League with runners in scoring position. And he makes an adjustment. This is exactly the same pitch that he struck out on looking in his first at bat. He said, All right, you want to try to come in there again? I realize you can get it there for a strike. I got to do something with it. The ball was elevated. He got just enough of it to drop it in. The third double of the inning. But not forget, do not forget, probably the biggest at bat was the base on balls drawn by David Bell. He just battled. He didn't give away his out. It kept the inning going. And as you said, John, it's a big inning now for Seattle. And for Dave Berber, the same old sad story right now. Two near misses on fly balls. And now the bloop single by Ichiro. I mean, they haven't exactly been hitting shots all around the yard, but they got four runs on the board. And Ichiro, a threat to steal, he has 38 stolen bases this year. I'll be real surprised if he sticks around for more than a pitch or two. Berber, one of the easiest pitchers in baseball to run on. Opponent successful in 16 out of 18 stolen base attempts. Ichiro moving him back to the bag, or uh, being moved back to the bag by Berba. Four runs are in, and the big crowd at the Jake is very subdued. Toward the middle, Marcus Cow. And that, at long last, ends the inning. Eight men come to back for the Mariners, and they put four on the board. It'll be Jim Tommy, then Ellis Burks coming up. 
Seattle four, Cleveland nothing. Last of the second, and that view of Jacobs Field from one of America's most enduring corporate images, the blimp spirit of Goodyear floating overhead. Goodyear asks the question: Have you checked your tires today? Just glad to have them with us on Sunday night baseball. As Jim Tomey takes ball one, and Jim Tomey had a month of July for the books. The curveball from Sealy misses two and zero the count. He won the triple crown in the American League for the month of July, if there is such a thing. And he led the league in batting average, home runs, and RBIs in the month. Twelve homers in the one month, a Maguireian pace, or maybe Bonzian, or Soso Sosa Sosaian. That's that's a harder one, isn't it? Well, the, one the, count. the thing all three of those guys have in common is that they have tremendous strength. There, there's people that are strong, and then there's this kind of strength that Jim Tomey has. Three and all the count. And he poured it right in on the inside corner. Three and one. Tomey, 34 homers to lead the league for the year in that category. He was off to a real slow start in April as well. Three and two. The high hard one. And there's a real good chance that with out the four runs in the top of the second, Sealy might have gone to something else, but he's got the lead. He knows the worst thing he can do is walk Jim Tomey in this situation. Just missing on the inside. Ball four to Tomey. Now, over at ESPN2, it's the Cubs and the Dodgers at Dodger Stadium. Let's get an update down with Brent Musburger at Dodger Stadium. Scoreless in the bottom of the second. Caros and then Marquise Grissom do up. The big play of the game, the defensive play by Mark Grutzelanik, saved Chicago. I should cost him two runs as we go back to John. All right, thanks, Brent. So we'll keep you posted on that ball game at Dodger Stadium. The Dodgers need a win to stay in first place in the National League West. The Arizona Diamondbacks only a half game back of them, and Arizona won its game at home against the Mets. The Giants were one game back of the Dodgers, and they won their game over the Phillies. So things are awfully tight in the National League West. Ellis Brooks hits a double play ball, and there it is. Guillen to McLemore to Olerud. Two down, nobody on. All about location. If you can make one good pitch on that pitch you can get two outs. Sealy knows that it has to be down. It needs to be away when you've got the power of Ellis Burks. He helps Sealy out by trying to pull that pitch. The routine ground ball. And just exactly what Aaron Sealy was hoping for. Two down nobody on Marty Cordova. And that's a ball outside. Ellis Burks just back from the disabled list. But Ellis has gone 70 at bats with only two RBI. So he had cooled off a bit before the injury. He got hit by a pitch by Octavio Dotel of the Houston Astros. I guess I, that makes it even worse, doesn't it? Oh. Not even a guy from your league <laughs> puts you on the disabled list. I got to look at that thumb today too. It's it's amazing that he's out there trying to play. He said the thing that hurts the most besides throwing is to get jammed. He might have started that swing a little bit early to prevent that from happening. The ball in the outer half. Spurs doesn't usually make those kind of mistakes with the bat in his hands. Two and two down to Cordova. That's why. I mean, this, this game is is a hard game, especially when you're talking about hitting. I mean, little things can take a guy out of his game subtly, but just enough to uh, to throw him off in a big way. It's so hard to succeed at this level when you're 100 percent healthy let alone when you're less than that. Marty Cordova resurrecting his career. And he hits that curveball through the middle for a base hit. Cordova who came into the game hitting 316 for Cleveland so he's a boy. Meanwhile, we want to tell you about the Little League World Series presented by Honda. ESPN and ESPN2 will be bringing you 31 games for the Little League World Series. Coverage begins this Saturday with the Southeast Regional Final at 6 Eastern, 3 o'clock Pacific time on ESPN2. For more information, log on to ESPN.com.
Did you play Little League? Oh, yeah. Were you any good? Yeah. <laughs> Were you six we're, foot seven? Were we off? <laughs> oh, and won the count to Travis Fryman. Fryman, I mean, probably was Cleveland's best player all round last year. Defensively, strong bat. Got hurt early this year and has not really come back. That curveball snapped in there for a call strike. They're hoping that he's about to break through, though. Fryman has homered twice in the last three games. His only home runs this year. He's still having trouble extending with that elbow. Seattle knows that well. The home run he hit yesterday was on a mistake. A fastball up and in. He just threw the head of the bat on it. Got it elevated. Nicely out of the park. Cleveland tradition. From the old ballpark. Municipal Stadium. And now over here, Jacob Swoop, John Adams. With the drum beat. For the tribe into a big round. Two and two the count. That's a little bit no. Now they've I think he's spurred them on to a lot more big rallies since they moved here to Jacobs Field than they did than he did in the old ballpark. Well, I know that well. I remember when it was just John and his family that would come out and watch his play. <laughs> he's got more people sitting around about there in the bleachers than he had in the whole ballpark of many games in the old yard. Runner going, the ball is in the right field, but there is Ichiro. And Fryman is retired. So are the Cleveland Indians. One hit, one left. Third inning coming up now. It'll be Edgar Martinez, John Olerud, and Al Martin. 4 0 Seattle. The terminal Tower off in the distance. A landmark in downtown Cleveland near the more recent landmarks, Gund Arena and of course Jacobs Field. There's been a lot of great baseball played in this yard since it opened in 1994. Here is Edgar Martinez for the Mariners. Big curveball from Dave Berber for a call strike as we view the pitches from the dead straightaway center field camera. It's a nice view of, of the actual movement of pitches and where they pass the plate. There's a ball down and away. A fastball missing. One ball and one strike. So you've got Edgar, the third place hitter, then Olerud, but not Brett Boone. In the last month or so, Luke Pinellas says they've been giving one of their regulars a night off every night. And tonight, Boone gets that rest. He's really cool from Maxwell. Look out. That one got away from Berber. Went right under the chin of Edgar Martinez. One and one. It was pretty good timing for manager Lou Pinella to give Boone that off day because of the fact that Seattle can run on Dave Burba. Brett Boone a little bit banged up, but as Lou Pinella said before tonight's game, he said, I'm going to have one of the coaches tell him he's not playing tonight because I know he's not going to be happy. There's a ball down and away. Three and one the count. Lou, he wants to give uh, the regulars some regular rest for the stretch run. And one of the luxuries of being 20 games ahead instead of being St. Cleveland's spot a game and a half out. Through base hit. Tommy made a dive, but Edgar Martinez doing that thing he does so well. You know, that's probably the only reason that I would be in favor of the designated hitters because without that, we would have never gotten to know Edgar Martinez. Physically just not able to play a position. Not only a good hitter, but his Mariner teammates will tell you he's even a better person. Now Edgar used to play third base, but he kept getting hurt. Yeah. A lot like Paul Monitor. Monitor used to play regularly at second base or third base, but he seemed to always get hurt. And finally, they just said, "Well, let's try to get him out of harm's way and use that DH rule." And uh, Edgar Martinez has been the best DH since the the rule came into being right before the interleague game started Lou Pinella had John Olerud playing some left field just to see how that would go he took a look at Edgar at third base 
And there's Olerud with the base hit. So both Edgar and Olerud go the other way with base hits here. Two men on for the Mariners. Not so important there for John Olerud to pull the baseball with a man on first and nobody out because Tomei was not holding Edgar Martinez on, playing in his normal position. Plus, you know, they don't want to extend Edgar. They're not going to try to get him from first to third if it's going to involve a close play. John Olerud, does anybody do anything more spectacular, any quieter than he does? Winning his first gold glove last year, finally getting away from J.T. Snow. When, when Olerud was in Toronto, J.T. was with the Angels. And then Olerud goes to the New York Mets. Well, J.T. followed him with the San Francisco Giants. J.T.'s had a firm grasp on that gold glove award. Here's a curveball down on the way to Al Martin. Now this is normally the spot where Brett Boone would be batting. There's Mike Bassick, a left-hander up in the Cleveland bullpen now. Burma gave up four in the second and he's immediately in trouble here in the third. Martin got the second inning rally started with his single in the shallow center that was misjudged initially by Kenny Lofton. That fastball is too low. Two and over the count. Now Cleveland has had 29 games this year where the starting pitcher has been knocked out before the fifth inning, including yesterday. Charlie Manuel removed his starter yesterday in the fourth inning. He'd like to get some innings out of Burba. That's back out of play. I mean, his bullpen pitched, what, six in or uh, I guess it was five and two thirds innings yesterday. There is Edgar Martinez at second. John Olerud at first. But not Brett Boone at the plate. I mean, Brett Boone has been an RBI machine this year. 102 batted in. And one of the great reasons, as he talked about before the game, is because he's inning behind Edgar and Olerud, who get on base so often. In fact, Boone has had more at bats with men in square position than anybody else in the majors. And of course, then he's produced. Well, if Boone would have been in the lineup, Al Martin would have been the guy that had to sit. Ella looked at the numbers that you mentioned earlier against Burba left handed hitters, 373. And that's a base hit for Martin. Edgar Martinez is still not running well with that uh, sore quad muscle. So three straight hits and eight of the last 10 Mariner hitters have reached safely since Berber retired the first four hitters of the game. It almost looks like to me that Dave Berber is tipping his pitches. If not, maybe the catcher, Anar Diaz, is telling Seattle what's coming. Berber was always a guy in the past that would give up his hits. He would bend, he would bend, but he never broke. He always stayed in the ball game, got deep into the game, He'd give you 30 plus starts a year, always give you over 200 innings. But right now, it looks like something's broke. Well, Charlie Manuel may well agree with you. Here he comes to the mound. He's got Basic, the left-hander, up in the bullpen. And you've got Cameron, who had a double off the big wall in left field his first time. Seven hits allowed by Berba in two-plus innings. In fact, seven hits to the last ten hitters plus a walk. Three singles in this inning. Well, and Seattle not trying to do anything more than take what you give them. We saw the fastball away to Ellis Burks that he tried to pull. It ended up being a double play. The only reason Al Martin got away with pulling that fastball away was because it was elevated. Three men on, nobody out, and the Mariners threatening to open it up. Big time early. Mike Bassick in for the bullpen making his major league debut. ESPN Sunday Night Baseball presented by Nextel. Mariners four, Cleveland nothing. Top of the third inning. And now the 23-year-old left-hander Mike Bassick from Duncanville, Texas. He's about to make his major league debut. He has a, a, a final couple of words with catcher Enar Diaz. And he inherits a tight spot. Three men on. Edgar Martinez at third, John Olerud at second, and Al Martin at first, and Mike Cameron, who already has a double tonight, at the plate. Bassick used primarily as a starting pitcher in the minor leagues, opened the year at double A, then went to Buffalo in triple A ball. And Cameron decided not to wait around to find out what kind of stuff he was featuring. He went right after the first fastball he saw. 
Well, you got to figure that the youngster's going to be a little bit nervous. It's not the situation Charlie Manuel wanted to bring him in for his major league debut, but if that first pitch is a sign of things to come, this kid's not afraid. On the outside corner, strike two called. And that is one of the things we were told about Bassett, that he's got outstanding control. He was once ranked by Baseball America magazine as having the best control among any of Cleveland's minor league pitchers. This year in minor league ball, only 21 walks in 123 innings. Backdoors him with a slider and didn't miss by much. One and two to count. And Cameron, I would figure, would be a, a tough man to double up. He's got great speed. Although checking the numbers, he's actually grounded into eight double plays. Middle infield looking for the double play. And fastball running off the outside. Two and two. I thought home plate umpire Jeff Nelson might have been fooled by that sharp slider on the previous pitch. He, just like Mike Cameron, has got to learn the stuff of Mike Basin. Three men on. Nobody out. Two and two the count. And again. Down and away. Full count. Now you got to go back to what he did on that first pitch. You got to challenge him. And Cameron's got just enough power to put up another four spot here in the top of the third as they did in the top of the second. Ian the switch hitter on deck. Three and two. Deep into left center field. And way back there. That is off the top of the wall. Martinez scores, Olerud scores. Martin stops at third. It's a double for Cameron, his second in a row. And he almost put up a four spot on that one. Six to nothing, Mariners. And Cameron with two doubles and three batted in already. He had three opportunities to try to nail down the outside corner in the third strike to Cameron. When he missed with all three, he had to go back to square one. He centered the fastball. Cameron missed that same pitch on the first pitch of the at bat. He did not miss that one. And just an outstanding job by the third base coach, Dave Myers. He knows that Edgar Martinez is going to score. There's Olerud. He's sending him. Now he puts up the stop sign immediately. Had he been any further down the line, Al Martin might have followed John Olerud and been thrown out at home. Now the infield comes in as Carlos Guillen switching around to bat right handed now. He's a switch hitter. Takes a curveball for a strike. Six to nothing. Seattle in the third inning. Run is it second and third? Still nobody out. To the inside and through the draw to infield. Martin will come in to score and being waved home is Cameron and he will score as Burke throws into second. And it is eight to nothing, Seattle. They've had five consecutive hits to start the third inning. They just don't give you strikes or outs they battle for everything they can possibly get they know that manager Lou Pinella has a lot of options you don't play well or in particular you don't play the game right you're out of position defensively you don't hustle you swing at the same pitch over and over again he's got options to go to when you get an opportunity to play for Pinella you better play well and they are. David Bell, he walked his first time. That's a foul out of play. On one. So Basic, he got a couple of quick strikes against Cameron, but then could not put him away. He's still looking for his first out as a big league pitcher. The Mariners tonight, in their at bats with men in scoring position, have had six hits in seven such at bats. Six for seven. Way outside. One ball, one strike. Well, now things will settle down for Mike Bassett here. He had the bases loaded. You were out of your environment. Your adrenaline was going crazy. Then on the next at bat, you had the infield in. You had to try to get a ground ball. You got it, but it wasn't at anybody. He's more comfortable here. There's a change up. We'll start seeing the whole repertoire of the young left hand. Lou Pinella. Said tonight, he says, Well, we'll see what our lineup looks like without our 
big RBI guy. Well, they've uh, they've masked his absence pretty well. Eight runs on the board. We're only in the third inning. And another base hit. A low fastball. It might have been out of the strike zone. Two men on, still nobody out, and here's an update from L.A. with Bill Pito. All right, John, as Nextel takes us to L.A., the Cubs and the Dodgers score this game here in the third. Gary Sheffield, the line of the Shields giving chase. It's a ground rule double, driving Paul Laduca, who also had a ground rule double, and the Dodgers trying to hold on to first place, lead at one zip. Thanks, Bill. Again, we'll keep you posted on that ball game, which is being uh, televised over on ESPN2, the Cubs and the Dodgers. Cubs leading the National League Central. At the start of the day, three, or rather, two and a half ahead of Houston, and Houston won its game today. Well, that one hits Tom Lampkin, and so the bases are loaded. So 12 of the last 14 Mariners, including the first seven of this inning, have reached base as we view that one from Mascan. Now you're supposed to try to get out of the way. <laughs> Looked to me like he actually moved in the way of that one, didn't he? If that was a fastball, he might have moved, but he knows that's an off-speed pitch. It's not going to hurt. The only thing it's, it's going, going to hurt is the ERA of Mike Bassett and also that once again of the Cleveland Indians pitching staff. Dave Berber, two plus innings tonight, charged with seven runs and seven hits. You know that's the frustrating part for me as a young broadcaster. I did all of this work on Dave Burba today. I talked to all of these guys. I've got all this great stuff, and and he's gone. Well, well, let, let's hear it. Let's hear some of the great stuff. <laughs> he was traded for Sean Casey. You know, he's been parts of some big name trades. He was traded for Kevin Mitchell, Deion Sanders. They're much bigger names than that. But he's gone. Yeah, now you can't use that stuff. <laughs> that curveball is in there for a strike to Ichiro, who is one for two. Those would have been great notes to have if he was still in the game. I feel bad for you that you can't use them. <laughs> Paul Brick today asked if he wanted to go out to land. No, I've got a lot of notes on right now. There's Ichiro hitting a high drive in the left center. Lofton. Tagging Guillen from third, he'll score. Also tagging Bell from second, he moves to third. That makes it a five-run inning, and it is nine to nothing. As Ichiro gets his third RBI of the game with the sacrifice fly, it also is the first out of the inning. This guy is just not intimidated by anybody. Left-handed pitcher, right-handed pitcher. Facing the big unit to start the All-Star game off with, getting a base hit. Look at the head down. All the movement from down below, but no movement with those hands until he has made up his mind. He's seen the baseball, and it's something that he can handle. Now Mark McLemore, the ninth hitter of the inning for the Mariners. They sent eight men to the plate in a four-run second inning. Now they have five on the board here in the third. They lead nine to nothing. McLemore struck out and grounded out in this game tonight. Now batting right-handed. Edgar Martinez, who led off the inning, is on deck. And Bassett misses down and away. And Ichiro in the All-Star game. Ichiro wears Randy Johnson's number, the number that the big unit wore when he was with the Mariners. And there was Ichiro in Seattle facing Randy Johnson in his first All-Star at bat. And he got robbed of maybe a triple by Todd Helton, but still turned it into a single. Eventually stole second base. He may get from home plate to first base faster than anybody in the game. It's a cold strike on the outside. Three and one. This is the play in the All-Star game we're talking about. That's pretty quick. I remember watching him in spring training, the very first game of the spring. And he hit a ground ball to shortstop, a routine two hopper. It was bang, bang at first. And the first base coach for the Padres, Alan Trammell, had clocked him, 
at 3.7 in the first spring training game of the year. <laughs> I could see running like that in the All Star game, but. Nope, a little bit low. So it's a walk to McLemore, and that reloads the bases. Now, right now, Charlie Manuel didn't have many options in yesterday's game here. He ran through his bullpen five and two thirds innings worth. And he needs somebody to eat up some innings here tonight. Yesterday, he used five different relievers. Two of them, David Risky and Danny Baez, also very young pitchers. Risky threw 40 pitches, Baez threw 37. That last at bat, though, from Mark McLemore typifies what Seattle as a team is all about and what he's about. He could have taken a swing at that ball. It was close enough to put a bat on it. You got a man at third base and only one out. You could selfishly try to pick up that RBI. You're not going to do it with a walk. But even with a nine to nothing lead, McLemore staying within himself, being all about the team, creating another opportunity for Edgar Martinez to drive in a bunch of runs. Edgar started this rally with a single. And he could not lay off that breaking ball down and away. 0 and 2 the count with Bell at third base. Lampkin at second and Mark McLemore over at first. Cleveland already trailing nine to nothing in the third inning. They were beaten here on Thursday by Oakland 17 to four. Inside didn't miss by much there. One ball two strikes. Oakland in fact in taking two out of three from them here scored 33 runs in the three games. Scored 11 runs in the first game and, and 17 in the getaway game on Thursday. Cleveland having trouble in its own ballpark for the first time. Now they might get two. Oh, this cow has to go right under his glove. One run is in and two runs are in. Bell and Lampkin both score. Wow, now that could have been an inning inning double play because Edgar cannot run. He's running at about 70, 75 percent. Effectiveness right now, I and mean, he not that fast to begin with. But you know what? When you sit back and watch the opposition bat around through the lineup, you just don't expect the ball to be hit at you. Omar Vizquel, we've seen him make that play a hundred times. It's a simple double play for him. But you just get out of your focus. You're not ready. You're not anticipating the ball being hit at you. You're anticipating another ball hit off the wall, another base on balls, and that's when things like that happen. Well, the official score apparently didn't feel like he's seen him make that play very often because he gave Edgar a base hit on that one. No, I didn't. <laughs> Is that right? One ball and no strikes to John Olerud. Olerud singled at the beginning of this inning. Now he's the 11th batter of the inning. 11 to nothing. The Mariners are ahead. Seven runs in in the third inning. And that. Curve ball a strike. One ball, one strike from Mike Bassick, who has faced seven hitters, given up four hits, hit a batter, walked a batter, and retired only one. Smash down the right field line, but foul. And the one guy he was able to retire was Ichiro, who hit a ball to the warning track in left center field that. Resulted in a sacrifice fly and an RBI. Eleven to nothing, Seattle. The Mariners. Well, you don't think of the Mariners with sluggers and big offense and whatnot, but they do lead the American League in run score. One to the count. That one gets through. Just past Roberto Alomar. Here comes the throw in, cut off by Tommy. McLemore scores. Martinez to second. It is 12 to nothing, and the fans are very unhappy. Everybody except Ichiro now has scored a run. Al Martin with two runs scored, Cameron with two, Bell with two, Lampkin with two runs scored. Really not batch pitches being made. That ball's down. 
Look at that pitch elevated a little bit. That's the only out of the inning. Pain on the outside corner. The questionable call on the play not made by Omar Bisquell. And Mike Bassick has got to be saying to him, so you know, I, I made these pitches in Triple A and, and got people out. Well, you're going to get a lot of people out in the big leagues with those pitches, but you're not going to get the Seattle Mariners out the way they're hitting, swinging the bats now. So a rough greeting to the show for Mike Bassick, 23-year-old left-handed. Diaz knocking that ball down. Bassick. So far, he's been charged with five runs in one third of an inning. Five runs to his own record. He's been charged with five hits. He's walked one and hit one. Al Martin is two for two in this game. He's singled to load the bases. And that's foul off the third base side. One ball and one strike. And there's Aaron Seeley. A little bit overkill for Aaron. I mean, he's 12 and 3 with a 3.41 ERA, but something about Sealy seems to bring whatever team he's pitching for seems to inspire their offense. Sealy has been extremely well supported throughout his career. In fact, he has the highest career run support of any active pitcher in the big leagues. 5.7 runs per game. Probably looking up at those 12 runs and okay guys that's enough. Let me get out there and get my five innings in. I mean he has been a while since he's thrown a pitch. Now Mark the 12th batter of the inning. Goes two and two but fooled on that breaking ball from Basin. Seely. Retired Travis Fryman in the second inning to end the inning at 8:49 Eastern Time, which was 30 minutes ago. And that's just a little bit low with a fastball, three and two. That was the 46th pitch thrown this inning by Cleveland pitchers, which isn't that many considering that eight runs have scored. Martinez, John Olerud with two hits apiece in the inning. Martin's got one. And he is down on strikes in the curveball. Out number two, and a sarcastic ovation from the big crowd of the Jake. Well, that's a season full of frustration for these fans and the problems. That Seattle has had with their starting pitching. Cameron doubled off the big wall in left field, did not get a run in the second inning. And uh, as the first man that Bassett faced with the bases loaded in the third inning, he did it again on a 3 2 pitch, knocking in two more. So he's scraped two balls off the wall and left and had three RBIs. Cameron has 72 RBIs for the year. Two on, two out, eight runs in. He started out a little bit differently this time with Edgar in second and Olerud at first. When Bassick first came into the game, he got two quick strikes on Cameron. Just and then missed. finally went to three and two. It's a nice start behind him. Maybe that'll be more successful for him. Eight runs. It is 12 to nothing. ESPN Sunday Night Baseball presented by Nextel. Mariners 12. Cleveland nothing. Coming up tomorrow night, 8 Eastern, 5 Pacific on ABC from Canton, Ohio. The Hall of Fame game. It'll be the St. Louis Rams and the Miami Dolphins. Marshall Falk. Running back leading the Rams. Quarterback Jane Fiedler and the Dolphins. Here is Anar Diaz. On one to count as he faces Aaron Seeley. Seeley with a 12 run lead. Seeley, who pitched a shutout. In fact, it was one of the best games of his career. A two hit shutout. And after the All Star break on Sunday Night Baseball against 
the Arizona Diamondbacks of the National League. That was his 11th win, and then he pitched a shutout in his next start after that. But since then, he's lost a couple, so he's trying to snap a personal losing streak here tonight. And at the same time, win his 13th. This Mariner rotation already with a 13-game winner in Freddie Garcia. He got number 13 yesterday. That's Freddie. And he's got the kind of stuff. I mean, you talk to his teammates who say, hey, Freddie Garcia's got a chance to be one of the top pitchers in this game. He is retired. One away. Now, over on ESPN2, it's the Cubs and the Dodgers. Let's get another into that game. Here's Brett Musburger. So the big hit of the inning, Marquise Grissom's 17th home run, putting the Dodgers up 2-0. And now Cora fouls one off. So the Dodgers lead it by two as we go back to John. All right, Brett, thank you. Dodgers out in front there. Of, uh, Eric Gagne, I believe it's Gagne versus uh, Lieber. Kenny Lofton. Lofton one out to Al Martin, and that is out number two. How many times when we get a Dodger update do we hear the name Paul LaDuca and the fire that he has brought to that ball club? His versatility hitting anywhere in the lineup, being able to catch, playing first base when Carlos was hurt. Duke, who an eight year minor leaguer. That's a called strike to Lamar Vizquel. And manager Jim Tracy said there were all kinds of speculation during the winter about who the Dodgers are going to bring in to catch trades and whatnot. And Tracy said he called the Duke and said, listen, don't pay any attention to any of that. You're the guy. You and Chad Kruger are going to be the catchers and you're going to be the regular catcher. It turned out. Cooter has basically caught for Chan Ho Park. And Loduka does the rest. And Loduka's had an all-star kind of a season. And Tracy said one of the reasons that he wanted Loduka, in addition to the fact that he thought Loduka was going to be a good player for him, was because he was the kind of a player, the kind of a personality that he wanted in that Dodger clubhouse. Because he was trying to change things around the way the Dodgers had been doing things. He wanted somebody who hustled. And play with that great kind of heart all the time, and who was not worried about personal statistics and that sort of thing. And how about the right kind of guy that Jim Tracy has been? All of the changes the Dodgers have had at that manager position the last four or five years, the stability that they had in the past, Walter Alston and Tommy Lasorda, looks like that stability is back. The Dodgers played extremely well despite what. You would expect to be crippling injuries. That one fouled by Viscal. Viscal with two down and nobody on. They're at the Jake. And uh, that, that score, by the way, is correct. That's not a, a misprint. 12 to nothing. Seattle out in front. I'm John Miller with Rick Sutcliffe. Rick was the uh, the bearded one. In case you didn't recognize him. <laughs> Everybody's looking for Joe. He looked just like himself. That's a base hit for this girl. Joe Morgan at the Hall of Fame this weekend. And congratulations to all of the uh, inductees today. So two down. Here is ESPN Game Track. Mike Cameron started the scoring with a one-out double in the second inning. Ichiro drove in the last two of a four-run third inning. Then Cameron launched one off the wall again in the third for two more to make it six to nothing. And that was the beginning of an eight-run rally that has Seattle out in front, 12 to nothing. Here is Roberto Alomar. He flied out to shallow right center his first time. Roberto said he's not feeling that well. He got a little uh, kind of a flu bug or, or whatever. The temperature. But Cleveland, I mean, this starting pitcher, they keep expecting it to get better, but it just has not been getting better. Tonight, the 30th time this year. 
That's more than a quarter of their game. 27 28 percent of their games with the starting pitch has been knocked out before the fifth inning. And it's called a strike at the outside and Alomar did not like the ball. Two and one. It's going to be so important to get Chuck Finley back in that rotation at 100 percent. He was not healthy earlier this year. Had some nerve problems with his neck. It affected his shoulder. Called strike. They're hoping that he'll be able to pitch Thursday in the series against the Minnesota Twins they've got upcoming. They have 12 games left with Minnesota. The team that they were one and a half games behind at the start of this night. Or, or the start of the day, Minnesota lost already. Today. Deep in the right field, if you go back, gets there. He gets a great jump and did on that one. One hit, one left. Down to the fourth inning, 12 to nothing, Seattle. Seattle leads 12 to nothing into the fourth inning. Let's go to Alvaro Martin. Well, John, immediately upon being eliminated by the Yankees in the ALCS last year, Carlos Guillen and his wife Amelia flew back with A Rod on his plane back to Miami to spend four vacation days with Alex Rodriguez. Rodriguez told him, you know, I'm not sure I'm going to be back next year, so I think you better get yourself a little bit healthy for next year. You never know. Guillen told me by the end of the four day stay, he had a pretty good feeling upon his return to Venezuela that he was going to be playing regularly. Yesterday, he plays his 106th game in, in the majors. That's one more than his entire career prior to that. He had shoulder surgery in 96 and knee problems in 99 and 2000. And Carlos Guillen, one for two. He was part of the Randy Johnson trade with Houston. That ball is caught by Roberto Alamo, and Guillen is retired, one away. There is Freddy Garcia, who also came from the Houston Astros and the Randy Johnson trade. As did John Halama, who has won seven games for the Mariners as mostly as a starting pitcher. So they gave away a great pitcher, Randy Johnson, who by the time he's finished may rank among the greatest who ever pitched. But at the same time, that trade is part of why they're so good right now. And how about the reports when the deal was made that general manager Pat Gillick got nothing in return? Well, it seems like Pat Gillick knew a lot more about that than what the media was saying. And that's a call strike. Woody Woodward was the, the GM at that time. But now that you bring up Pat Gillick, they traded Ken Griffey Jr., a trade that he wanted. And they accommodated him, sending him home to Cincinnati as Bell hits the fly ball in the center. And uh, Lofton makes the grab. Two men down. And not only did he acquire some, uh, some talent that has helped the ball club in that deal, but it freed up some salary that they were able to trade for people that they might not have been able to, uh, to bring in otherwise. In fact, uh, in the trade they got, Mike Cameron, who's their regular center fielder, and also Brett Tomko, who's in the minors right now. But then they went out and signed John Olerud, Aaron Seeley, uh, Sasaki, their closer, Arthur Rhodes, their, their left-handed setup man, and Mark McLemore. Stan Javier, also one of the free agents picked up that year. And then he turned around and did the same thing again over last winter when he got Ichiro, he got Brett Boone, and also Jeff Nelson to solidify that pin even more. After uh, Alex Rodriguez left as a free agent. Alomar throws out Lampkin. And Mike Bassett has a six pitch inning. Life looks a little bit better. Juan Gonzalez coming up. ESPN Sunday Night Baseball presented by Nextel. The Mariners 12, Cleveland nothing. Last of the fourth inning. Aaron Seeley got the huge lead. And has a three hit shutout working. Juan Gonzalez leads off, then Jim Tomey and Ellis Burks. Now, ordinarily, this would uh, promise to be a, a real tough inning for any pitcher, but so he's got a 12 run lead. He uh, can pitch confidently no matter who's up right now. Gonzalez lined out to center his first time. In the left center field, Cameron. Has to play this one off the wall. Their hand pick up. And Gonzalez, remember, he's got the hamstring strain, still not running at peak efficiency, holds with a single. They were the second best defensive team in baseball last year, being the Seattle Mariners. Cleveland was better, but they're the number one defensive team this year. 
Not only do they not make errors, but they take bases away from teams. Each a row with an outstanding play on Robbie Alomar's drive. And a terrific play here by Mike Cameron. He couldn't get to it. The perfect angle, bare hands the ball, the strong throw, it's on its way. And Gonzalez had to pull up at first base. Now, Jim Tomey, he walked his first time. And that curveball is in there for a called strike. Well, I mean, you look all around the field. That older Rood, who's so solid at first base. David Bell, who's been outstanding at third base. Ichiro, who may be the best right fielder in the league. And Cameron, who's as good as it gets in center field. Brett Boone has always been an outstanding second baseman, although he's not in the lineup tonight. Former Gold Glove winner. And curveball misses. Two balls and a strike to count to Jim Tommy. And some of the Mariners were saying before the game that they think Mark McLemore deserves a gold glove. I said, what position? They said, at six different positions. <laughs> Which could be a first. Three and one the count. Although when you get a guy like McLemore, you know, Tony Phillips, I remember, was one of the, the guys who played every single day but could be anywhere in the field on a given day. So not a regular player, but in a utility mode. But in effect, McLemore's doing that now. I mean, maybe a guy like that who's outstanding in the field, maybe they need a new category. Oh, another thing. Well, oh, kind of like the sixth man in the NBA. Kind of thing. That one is it high in the air, deep in the right center field. Cameron and each year old, and God, a home run. Number 35 for Tommy, extending his American League lead. It hasn't shown up yet as far as runs are concerned, but Aaron Seeley very frustrated he cannot get his curveball over early in the count. He missed with his location twice in the at bat to Tomey. Eventually had to challenge him with the fastball. And Jim Tomey just does not miss many pitches when he's in a good streak as he is now. He just looks like power when he's at the plate. Dallas Burks takes too high. Once again, another breaking ball. Seeley has lost his last two starts coming into tonight's game. He just said he's been inconsistent. Not had the release point, the feel for that good curveball, which is his strength. Dallas Burks, 287, 22 homers. Burks, who came. To Cleveland after being with the Giants the last couple of years, hits one high and foul down the left field line. That's a pretty good shot. And although the wind we had earlier coming in from that part of the ballpark has uh, stopped blowing for a while. 418 feet was the measurement on that home run by Tommy. Tommy might have been the one that stopped the win. It's <laughs> strong enough to turn it around. And that one in on Ellis Burks. Ellis just had a couple of uh, monster years for the, uh, for the Giants. Considering the number of games he played, he was limited to only about 390 at bats a season. San Francisco because you know, he could DH. Strike three on the outside, and Ellis very unhappy about that call. Thought he had the walk. Laren Cedar just continues to make big pitches when he has to. He walked Tomei to start the bottom of the second inning. He got the double play, painting the outside corner on Ellis Burks. Here he does it again. In the mind of home plate umpire Jeff Nelson. But you could see Tom Lampkin bringing that pitch back to the plate. Which anytime you see a catcher doing that, it tells you that even the catcher thought the ball was out of the strike zone. One ball to no strikes to Marty Cordova, a one time American League rookie of the year. He gets that outside call again. One ball, one strike. You know, we've come at Ellis Brooks. He had 96 RBIs for San Francisco in each of the last two years. 
with fewer than 400 at bats. There's that big curveball from Sealy. One ball and two strikes, but one of Burks's hopes coming here to Cleveland was that with the DH rule, he'd get more at bats without having to take the pounding on his knees. I mean, he played a couple of days in the outfield and would need a day off. The knees would get all swollen up. He's only played 14 games in the outfield this year. He was in the top 10 last year in RBIs per at bat in the National League. Last couple of years, just 120 games started. As you said, 96 RBIs both years and 70 plus runs each year scored. A little hole, and there he goes Dean. Not nearly in time to get pulled over. Acrobatic effort there by Dean. That's the third hit of the inning for Cleveland. But they are trailing 12 to 2. Over the past 75 years, millions have watched the Goodyear Blum, uh, Blimps hovering over special events. Tonight, Bob Jacobs Field is the spirit of Goodyear carrying on that tradition. You can find out more about the Goodyear Blimp fleet on the internet at www.goodyear.com. We're glad to have them overhead You're with us tonight on Sunday Night Baseball from Cleveland. Travis Fryman now. Again, that call on the outside. Now, when you're a pitcher and you, you get a call out there, not a bad idea to keep going out there. Right? It's just like fishing. You bait your hook and you throw it in the spot. You catch a fish. What do you do? You take it off the hook. You rebait the hook. You throw it back in the same spot, don't you? If he's going to continue to let that outside corner grow, and Seeley, being a veteran pitcher, having the command of his fastball to stay in that location I would expect that he will Another play ball. there's the out there McLemore to first double play and Fryman rounds into a pair to win the inning Jim Tomey with number 35 top of the order now Ichiro coming up 12 to 2 Seattle MLB at Home is presented by Scott's, who knows that some of the best games are played in the backyard. Scott's, grow more good. Sunday Night Baseball from Cleveland. And the, the hometown team is taking it on the chin right now. 12-2 Seattle. Team with the best record of the majors. Clobbering Cleveland. Here is Ichiro. He takes a called strike. Ichiro who makes his home in Kobe, Japan in the offseason. There's Russell Brannion now in left field. He's Ellis Burks gets the rest of the night off. Ichiro takes a called strike from Basic on the inside. Ichiro tonight is struck out, hit a two run single, and hit a sacrifice fly. Officially one for two, three batted in. Ichiro is so en enormously famous in Japan that when he got married in the spring of 2000, he and his uh, wife to be actually had the ceremony in Los Angeles to avoid the massive publicity assault that it would have generated. Back home in Japan. There's some uh, Ichiro fans here in Cleveland tonight. One and two the count. And right back to Bassett. Ichiro is retired. There is one away. Ichiro with a very interesting, unique kind of approach to the play. Edgar Martinez, quite an authority on hitting, talked about it. His mechanics are very, very good. He looks like uh, to some people that his his feet are out of the box when he swings, but when he does that, his hands always stay back, and, and he weighs on the ball very good. There's a lot of things that happen with Ichiro. McLemore with a base hit to left field on the first pitch here, the first hit for McLemore. From the waist down with Ichiro, there's a lot of activity. He's got a bigger leg kick on certain pitchers that don't throw real hard where he can generate more power, but watch the hands. They never move. He lets his right shoulder simply take him back into the hitting position. And when he recognizes something to hit, he goes directly to the baseball. That's the reason he doesn't walk much. He doesn't strike out much. When he sees something he likes, he does something with it. Seven time batting champion for the Oryx Blue Wave. It's a ball outside. Edgar Martinez who has grounded out single by the way they did change the scoring call and Edgar was up there in the third inning on his second at bat to an error on Omar Vizquel 
official scorer. Apparently he was uh, browbeaten by Rick Sutcliffe for the change of that call. That's a base hit for Edgar. A clean single here, his second hit of the game, McLemore to second. Alvaro Martin on well, Ichiro. John Rick was mentioning that he had changed his batting stance. He won six batting titles using his front leg as a pendulum before he swung at the ball. Last season, during spring training in Japan in the Pacific League, he decided to put his foot down and have a more standard approach. He said, I wanted more power while having the same plate coverage. The power numbers went down, but you can't complain. He won his seventh batting title by hitting 387. That's a career high. Edgar was saying he's such a natural, instinctive, intelligent hitter. The scary stat about Ichiro is 27 years old. He said, in the next 10, 15 years, who knows what he can do. And that's a called strike to Ed Sprague, the pinch hitter for John Olerud. Mariners ahead 12 to 2, so Ed Sprague, a veteran. A One-time World Series hero with the Toronto Blue Jays against the Atlanta Braves. When was that? 1992. He had a big home run that helped turn that series around a little bit. Takes off the outside. One ball, one strike. There's Gerald Perry, the hitting instructor for the Mariners. Telling me that Ichiro hits more home runs in batting practice than any other Mariner player. He said it's amazing the things the guy has done the first half of the year when he's never seen any of these pitches before. Gerald thinks that Ichiro's power numbers will go up the second half. Into left center. That one will go up against the wall on a hop. The Karen played by Brandon. Coming in to score is Macklin with the throw goes to second, at which point Edgar Martinez dug for third and made it easily. Brannion threw in behind him, and Edgar, seeing that, just took off for third with the sore quadricep muscle at all. Spring with the RBI, 13 to 2 Seattle. I think if Lou Pinella had it to do over again, Edgar would have stayed at second base. They just got him back into the lineup. They know that they need him healthy. Sprague with another rocket delivered off Cleveland Indian pitching. Brandon coming up with it. Take a look at McLemore. He knows that he's going to score. Now Edgar pulls up the brakes. He's just going to stop right there. But he's far enough down the line that when he sees the long throw to second, he knows even with his lack of speed, with his lack of legs, the injury that he has, he could get to third base easily. Now Al Martin. First and third, one out. Nice pickup by Tommy, and he gets the shore out at first. Coming into score is Edgar, and the second is Sprague. RBI for Martin. Take a look at him before. Look at that big leg kick. Now watch what he does. He just simply calms that front half down. He's also gotten bigger and stronger with his upper body. So they think that those power numbers will come back with the lack of adrenaline and, and power that he created from the waist down before. 14 to 2 now Seattle. Here is Cameron who's had two doubles, three RBIs. Runner at second, two down. Passing to the plate. That's a strike. Alvaro Martin on the each year. Gerald Perry, the hitting coach, mentioned to us that Ichiro is being told two things, really. The only two instructions he gets from the hitting coaches is stay behind as the pitch comes and keep the ball on the ground. And that might be a reason we don't see a lot of balls go up, come out of the park. But even Edgar told me he can hit home runs. I see him a lot during the uh, batting practice. And he also mentioned that the only thing he's asked Ichiro, Edgar, has asked Ichiro, is what do you do with your front hip? Apparently, Ichiro keeps the front hip back as he moves forward. Edgar's never seen that in any hitter. He felt maybe that's something I should pick up. Yeah, that's what Edgar needs. He needs to change his style a little bit. Obviously, he's only hitting, what, 330 or whatever lifetime. <laughs> All into the count. I mean, Edgar, part of the reason why he's such a great hitter is Cameron goes down on the slider in the dirt. Is that he's always trying to improve himself. 14 to 2, the Mariners will be back. ESPN Sunday Night Baseball, presented by Nextel, is brought to you by Terminex. Termite problems? Call 1-800-TERMINEX for our advanced termite baiting program. And by TGI Fridays. In here, it's always Friday. 
John Miller and Rick Sutcliffe from Jacobs Field in Cleveland, the Seattle Mariners. And we are duly impressed. We've decided that, yes, they are for real. After 110 games, they've made believers of us. There's Ed Sprague staying in the lineup at first base after he pinch hit for John Olerud. And there is uh, Anar Diaz, the Cleveland catcher against Aaron Seeley. And that is a foul down the left field line. Diaz popped out to third his first time. Kenny Lofton and Omar Vizquel will follow. Sellout crowd in Cleveland, although attendance is actually down a little bit this year. Diaz apparently broke his bat of that one, so he's going back to the dugout for a new piece of wood. They had a ceremony a while back in Cleveland to celebrate the top 100 Cleveland players in the 100 years of Cleveland Indians baseball. One of them was Dwayne Kuyper, a very fine second baseman. Sure. Back in the 70s and into the 80s. He came back and he says it was kind of a thrill to see what had transpired here in Cleveland over the years from what he remembered as a player, the, the big old ballpark where nobody used to go to the games. The team was never a contender. You played in some of those Cleveland teams as well, Rick. And then to see this gleaming new jewel of a ballpark and Cleveland always a contender, always a power in the league. And yet he came back and said, uh, you know, Wayne Kuyper, now a broadcaster in San Francisco, came back and said, you know, I think the fans are a little bit spoiled now. <laughs> Is a lot of them apparently don't remember the 35 years where they were never one time in a pennant race. Well, they're not only spoiled with the, what they've done here with the stadium, but the whole downtown area is just a lot. He's had a great effect, not just on the Cleveland Indians ball club, but this downtown area in Cleveland as well. A whole different city than it used to be. In the American League Central, Minnesota lost today to Kansas City. Cleveland one game out at the moment, but they are trailing by 12 runs here in the fifth inning. So and they again fall back to a game and a half out. The White Sox were defeated by Tampa Bay at Comiskey Park today. Fastball outside, two and two to Diaz. Just keeps going with that fastball away because it's really the only pitch he has had tonight. Release point on that curveball, just too inconsistent for Aaron Seeley to get beat with that pitch. Ball. And David Bell throws out Diaz for one away. Well, we talked to Aaron Seeley about how he throws his curveball. He's really cool. The secret to, from, for me is to, to be able to get, to make it feel like the, that the ball actually comes out and rolls over the top of the finger, which means I've gotten all the way out in front of my pitch. Um, I don't feel like I've had a real consistent one this year by any means. But it's, it's been coming around. It's been better of late. And you could see what he was talking about with that grip was to get as much of his finger between the baseball and home plate. That's what the curveball is all about. It's more of an off speed pitch. Often fouling one. Bell over to the Cleveland dugout. He's got it. Out number two. He pulls with his middle finger as hard as he can. The baseball is back. You try to create as much rotation as you can. And to get the downward movement, you get your fingers between home plate and the baseball. Now the difference with the slider is that it's more of a power pitch. You kind of offset your grip slightly. You get your thumb out of the way, and then you throw a fastball with a finish. That, keep, that creates that sweeper there. A lot of curveball pitchers having big years this year because of the strike zone that they've opened up above the belt. That curveball starts in that zone, it comes straight down, and it gives a curveball pitcher more plate to work with. It didn't really help the slider guy or the secret guy because they go east and west. Omar Vizquel, one ball, one strike. Vizquel, one for two. Take a look at the breaking ball. See how he tried to get his fingers in front of it? But you can see the grip that he showed us on TV had more finger in front of the baseball than what he's getting now. Cameron grabs that one, and Cleveland has gone one, two, three against Sealy. Into the sixth inning now. 14 to 2, Seattle. ESPN Sunday Night Baseball tonight from Cleveland. The Seattle Mariners closing in on 100 wins already, although it's early August, leading 14 to 2 tonight into the sixth inning. Changes now for Cleveland. Roberto Alomar 
who was feeling under the weather when the game began anyway, gets the rest of the night off. Colbert Cabrera goes into play at second base. Russell Branion moves in from left field to play third as Fryman departs. And Will Cordero goes into play left field. He'll hit in Fryman's number eight spot in the order. And Mike Bassick in relief of Dave Berber to Carlos Guillen. Guillen takes low and outside for ball one. Guillen one for three. He hit a two run single back in the third inning win. The Mariners scored eight runs. Second time this week that a team has come in from the West Coast and had an eight run inning against Cleveland. And Cabrera throws out Guillen. And there is one away. Take a look at the high breaking ball that we were talking about here with Juan Gonzalez. Look at him just completely disregard that. Seeley getting it back on the inside part of the plate. Now watch Diaz. Immediately he goes, All right, I'm not going to swing at it. Oh, wait a minute. I got two strikes. I got to protect. There's a new strike zone. He has to try to put the ball in play. He does. And it was an easy out, a ground ball to the third baseman. That's what has been opened up now. I remember. Billy Williams, great hitting instructor, Hall of Famer with the Cubs, talking about how people don't even swing at hanging curveballs anymore. Our eyes used to light up, but the strike zone had gotten so small and so low, something had to be done, and that's what they did. David Bell, the eighth place hitter, has walked and scored a run, singled and scored a run, and fly down. One ball, one strike to count to David Bell. Congratulations to Kirby Puckett. Inducted into the Hall of Fame today, along with Dave Winfield and Bill Mazeroski. And it was pointed out that the three are sort of joined together in that. They each hit crucial, in the case of Mazeroski and Puckett, home runs. In the case of Winfield, a, I don't know if it was a home run or just a big extra base hit that helped their teams win World Series. Mazeroski hit one of the most famous World Series home runs of all time. Cabrera's got that one. Bell retired out number two. Kirby Puckett had that game winning home run in extra innings in game six of the 92 World Series against Atlanta. Dave Winfield had a, uh, a clutch uh, extra base hit to help. Uh, let's see, Kirby was 91. Winfield was 92. And the Toronto Blue Jays defeated Atlanta numbers on Kirby Puckett would have continued to gone up more gold gloves could have been a 3,000 hit guy if not for the vision problems that happened with Kirby. I mean, Kirby was sort of the American version of Ichiro. I mean Kirby went up there to swing and say to Kirby what are you looking for when you're up to this? He said I'm looking for something anywhere near the strike zone. I'm up there to hack. And we, it was a, a great hitter great bad ball hitter. And a great center fielder. How many home runs did he take away from people at the Metrodome? Lampkin, the hitter, too far in from Bassett. Two and one the count. And you saw all three of those guys. They were all round players, especially Puckett and Winfield. Offensive and defensive. They could beat you either way. And Bill Mazeroski, I mean, Joe Morgan has often said just the best second baseman he ever saw. Just after Cabrera got out of his way. Nice play. 14 to 2 Seattle. There's a called strike from Aaron Seeley to Colbert Cabrera. As we go to the Cleveland half of the sixth inning, Charles Gibson has come on in relief of Ichiro in right field for the Mariners. The ball lifted to left field deep. And Elmark right in front of the wall. One away. Always score a run. He doesn't always drive in a run. It seems like he does, but the one thing each road does every single day or night that he comes to the ballpark is bring his glove and that strong right throwing arm that he possesses. I mean, it, it, that's a gold glove. You talk about rookie of the year and all star and what have you. I don't know of anybody playing a better right field than each road. Eddie Taubenzi. Veteran left handed batting catcher, pinch hitting for Juan Gonzalez now. And that's a ball. So the Cleveland Indians continue to struggle here in their home yard where they have pounded on many a team. 
since it opened up. Tompkins, he pops it up. Acklemore, the second baseman. Now, number two. Two down. Meanwhile, we've got uh, an update from Bill Pito. All right, John Hall of Fame inductions today. Dave Winfield, the first to go in as a Padre, said he was glad he picked baseball over all the other sports. Bill Mazeroski won the 1960 World Series, but a great fielder, of course. And Kirby Puckett, at 40, the third youngest player to ever get into the Hall of Fame. His career cut short because of the eye trouble. Congratulations to those uh, Hall of Famers once again. Joe Morgan up there with the, uh, the Hall of Famers for the weekend his uh, fellow Hall of Famers Ross Newhan the great baseball writer of the Los Angeles Times into the Hall of Fame today as Tommy swings and doesn't get it one ball one strike and also congratulations to Felo Ramirez the Spanish broadcaster of the Florida Marlins 50 years broadcasting baseball in Spanish Felicidades Felo Ramirez La Voz de los Marlins en Español you know, and I think of Winfield and Kirby Puckett too. We all know what they've done on the field, but two of the most giving guys off the field in their communities as baseball players. Tommy, who homered his last time, at the 35 for him, fouls one out of play. Continue back to this Cleveland ball club. They've lost six out of seven coming into this game. Oakland came in here, won two out of three from them. The, the wins were by scores of 11 to two and 17 to four. Now Seattle has come in and they're about to make it three straight. Barring a, a, a miraculous comeback by Cleveland here. Before the game on Friday, as you see Lou Pinella's ball club, who, I mean, Lou is the, the ultimate what? Me worry? About what? Not much to worry about for Lou Pinella right now, but uh, for Charlie Manuel, he had a team meeting before the Friday game. And he told the press after the game about the meeting. And he said, sometimes I think that we, meaning his ball club, get lackadaisical. He said, we can put out a little more, hustle a little more. And he said that he told the ball club that they should let their talent come out and put forth their best effort down the stretch. Well, they're so talented that at times it looks like they're just going through the motion. Like they're going to take the postseason for granted. That one is pulled foul. They might have done that last year. Waited too late into the season to show that fire to get into a position to play into October. And there were many, and Jim Tomey included, who felt that that really was true. That in fact, he thought maybe it was good for Cleveland to have that happen last year, that it taught them something. I mean, they'd had a lot of years where they almost had a pass into the postseason, but last year they got tested by the White Sox, and they got left out. Tomey's down on strikes. Seven in a row retired by Seeley. He and the Mariners are out in front, 14 to two into the seventh. To Seattle into the seventh inning. This copyrighted telecast is presented by Authority, the Office of the Commissioner of Baseball, and may not be reproduced or retransmitted in any form. And the accounts and descriptions of this game may not be disseminated without express written consent. For the most extensive coverage of Major League Baseball, log on to MLB.com. Major League Baseball, connect with it. Mariners with Charles Gibson hitting in place of Ichiro during the seventh inning. Mike Bassick in his major league debut. At third, there is Branyan and Gibson really hustling up the line, but thrown out nonetheless. And there is one away. Just a real tough way for Mike Bassick to start his major league career, coming in with nobody out, the bases loaded, top of the third inning. Tougher even with the fact he had to throw out of the stretch that whole inning. He just never got comfortable missing his spots, not able to use his change up, which he's able to use now. He's really settled in since then. He gave up a couple of runs in the fifth, which is going to happen when you're playing against a team like Seattle. But Mark McLemore has a, a walk and a single, two runs scored. He's one for three officially. Stan Javier has come out on deck. In place of Edgar Martinez. And that's another base hit for McLemore, hit number 15 for the Mariners. The ESPN game track. Ichiro capped off a four run second inning with this two run single. Then Cameron in the third inning against Bassett, a two run base loaded double, his second double of the game. 
Jim Tomey launched his 35th homer. He leads the American League in the fourth inning for Cleveland's only runs. A four run second and eight run third for the Mariners. As they build a 12 to nothing lead, they lead right now 14 to 2 in the seventh. And here is Stan Javier. Javier. Switch hitter. Up here against Bassett in the seventh inning. Javier got his first look in the big leagues when he was 19 years old. In the several teams, and uh, Charlie Manuel says he managed against Javier. About to 18, 19 years ago, and he was managing in the minor leagues, and Javier was just getting started. He says the thing that impresses him about Javier is that it, as he has gotten older, the level of his game has not gone down. But he's stayed the same player. He's still a very fine outfielder. Very versatile, hits well. And one thing that seems to be consistent with Javier, you look at the teams that he's played for over the years, they've always been teams in the bad place. He's been with nine teams in his career, and it's not been because he's not been wanted, it's been just the opposite. The versatility that he has, having a switch hitter on Luke Pinella's bench. The only thing missing with Stan Javier was enough power to be an everyday player. At the speed, always a good high stolen base percentage. And just one of those chemistry guys, those intangibles that he brings to a club that don't always show up on the stat sheet. Going on to Javier. That's over the inside corner from Bassick for a called strike. Two and two the count. John Miller and Rick Sutcliffe, Sunday night baseball. The Mariners in Cleveland. And putting the heart to the Cleveland Indians. I mean, the more you see the Mariners, the more impressive they get. They are 81 or at the end of this game should be 81 and 3. That one is caught in shallow right by Cordova. The next Sunday, we just haven't gotten enough of the Mariners. We'll see Maglio Ordonez and the White Sox up against Ichiro and the Mariners from Safeco Field, Seattle, 8 Eastern, 7 Central, 5 Pacific on ESPN. Esos partidos de béisbol están disponibles en español a través de ESPN Deportes. Llame a su operador de cable local o DirecTV. Para más información, conéctese a ESPNDeportes.com. Sunday Night Baseball is available on ESPN Radio and in Spanish on ESPN Deportes. For más información, log on uh, to ESPN.com. John Miller along with Rick Punto Sutcliffe <laughs> from Jacobs Field. Rick Sutcliffe, who has a, a, a part of Cleveland Indians history. He got traded from Cleveland in 1984, and after he left, they got good. <laughs> I mean, it was 10 years after. Not immediately. Sprague is out. That's the inning. 14 to 2 Seattle into the last of the seventh. And Russell Brandon driving one into the alleyway, deep into right center. Russell Brannion going para la calle. His 15th home run of the year and only 250 at bats. He's a big, strong guy who strikes out an awful lot, but he's one of those guys who got enormous potential. Like 400 home run potential, but along with that could possibly come a couple of thousand strikeouts. Knows that Aaron Seeley's got the big lead. Knows Aaron Seeley wants to throw everything in the strike zone. Got a good pitch to hit, and as he can, hit it a long ways. Well, it is 14 to three. Marty Cordova, two for two, including an infield single. And the count now is quickly 0 and 2 to Cordova. Russell Brannion came into the game in the fifth inning in left field, replacing Ellis Burks, and moved to third base. Now he has. A home run, and that was no cheap. I mean, that was a line drive. That was not one of those big soaring home runs. The liner, up. he was astounded it had enough on it to make it all the way out there. As Cordova is down on strikes for out number one. Well, Cleveland could have picked up some starting pitching before the deadline, but it would have cost them him. And their front office just did not want to give that guy up. They've given up some power hitters in the past, and it's cost them. Sean Casey. Brian Giles, Jeremy Burnitz, Richie Sexton, who 
hit a grand slam homer today against Atlanta. Here is Bill Cordero taking a strike. This is his first at bat. Seattle's bullpen is getting busy for the first time tonight. Going to the Cordero there is John Halama, one of the trio of pitchers acquired from Houston in the Randy Johnson trade three years ago. I showed you some of the other players and they there's Freddie Garcia who came in that trade along with Carlos Guillen. Also when Ken Griffey Jr. was traded they got some talent for him plus they had the salary mobility in the roster to acquire more. And he is just fouled on the left field line. Pat Gillick had become the GM at the time Griffey was traded and then they did the same thing this past offseason when they lost Alex Rodriguez to free agency. Pat Gillick run out and brought in a lot more talent so now they don't have those big superstars that they used to have I mean this is one of the most and I'm talking about Seattle one of the most interesting teams in terms of superstar talent I mean the maybe the best right handed hitter Edgar Martinez maybe the best player in the game Ken Griffey Jr. The, the, the great young shortstop Alex Rodriguez the great left hander Randy Johnson I mean I mean they had great talent all over the field but they uh, are now without all of those superstars now the best team they've ever had. And uh, after Alex Rodriguez left they went signed Brett Boone also Ichiro and the former Yankee uh, relief pitcher Jeff Nelson all of whom have been key men in this lineup and on this club. Well before last year Gillick signed Aaron Seeley as a free agent. Look at Jeff Nelson figuring he's got the night off with this big lead Seattle has to this point. Aaron Seeley, one of five guys over the last three years that has won at least 17 games. We've all heard of Pedro Martinez, the big unit, Greg Maddox, and David Wells, but this is the fifth guy that has had at least 17 wins and well on his way to doing it again this year. He's going after number 13 tonight and leading by 12 runs. In the seventh inning. Figure the unit will win at least 17. Greg Maddox is going to do that again. Pedro Martinez probably won't. Neither will David Wells. Up the middle, and Einar Diaz has a base hit. By the way, he has only an 11 run lead now because of Brandon's home run. I knew it was to the lot. 14 to 3. Diaz with his first hit. Well, whenever the Goodyear blimp is hovering above a game with its camera focused on an event, you know you're getting a, a unique view of the action overhead tonight is the blimp Spirit of Goodyear based in Suffield, Ohio, very near Akron, which is the world headquarters for the Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company. It's a called strike over the outside to Lofton. Lofton one for three in the game. 14 to 3 the Mariners lead. Seattle with a win tonight will be 81 and 30. And three years ago we had the Yankees have that historic season. The Yankees establishing a, an American League record by winning 114 games, although fans here in Cleveland will remember are quick to point out that their winning percentage was not as good as the 1954 Cleveland Indians. Who had been the, the record holder? They won 111 and lost 43 when the schedule was eight games shorter. The Yankees won 114 and lost 48. And can Aaron Seeley's Seattle Mariners approach that figure? I mean, they appear intent upon doing it. Jeff Nelson has sort of an interesting view in all of that because. Uh, He's here with the Seattle Ball Club and he was there with the Yankees three years ago. And he's a big part of the main thing those two teams have in common. Tremendous bullpens. If you've got the lead after six innings, you can just count on that victory. They have outscored their opponents from the sixth inning on by 110 runs. And it's not so much that Seattle scores a lot, they just don't let you score. Diaz was running as Lofton takes ball forward. But two on, two out, and Omar Vizquel is coming up. I mean, some of the other things are very similar. As we uh, you, you bring up the bullpen, I mean, look at this. Arthur Rhodes and the opponents are hitting 180. I mean, he's a slump in the making for a, 
any hitter. Then Jeff Nelson, he's had 46 innings and he's allowed 18 hits. And then Sasaki, the closer, the former Japanese great, in his second year with the Mariners, he's right at the top of the league with Mariano Rivera. 35 saves but Seattle knew that coming into the year because those three guys were the top three guys in the bullpen last year as far as the lowest opponent's batting average against was concerned although Jeff Nelson did that for the Yankees last year and not for the Mariners. Nelson was one Sasaki was two and Arthur Rhodes there in the middle was number three. And this ball one to Omar Vizquel two on two out. Mariners, when you get into their bullpen, the game's almost over. When they've read after, after six innings, which means a long way to go yet. 63 and three, and when they're tied after six, 10 and two. And think back to before Sasaki got here, the problems Lou Pinella had closing out ball games. Well, now he's got a closer for the seventh inning, one for the eighth inning, and another one for the ninth. Red Green said he said, hey, I know. If we're ahead late in the game with our bullpen, I take my chances. Three and other count to Vizcal. Cabrera is on deck. Is Sealy might be starting to tire now. Big lead at all. He's sort of 115 pitches in. Number 116, way out of the strike zone, and the bases are loaded, and here comes Pinello. Yeah, he's walked the last two guys. Aaron Seeley just averaging two base on balls per nine innings on the year. So even though he has only pitched into the seventh inning, he's been in that uniform tonight for a long time. Look at how Pinella handles things. Comes out, takes a look into the eyes. You want to get the last guy or you need help? So John Halama, the left-hander, will come in from the bullpen. We'll be right back. John Halama comes out of pitch down in relief of Aaron Seeley with a 14-3 score. The Mariners leading the Cleveland Indians. Halama, although he had a winning record at one point, was struggling enough that the Mariners sent him back to the minor leagues to uh, sort things out. And I guess he did while he was there. He pitched a no-hitter. So they brought him back, but now he's in the bullpen. Well, they're starting pitching and, and depth at the pitching position reminds me a lot of, of the Dodgers back in the 70s and the early 80s when they were just stocked from top to bottom not only outstanding pitching at the big league level for Seattle they got a tremendous rotation going in triple A. Now here is Robert Cabrera for the second time he fried out deep to left in the sixth inning the bases are loaded with Diaz who singled at third base. Lofton who walked at second and Vizquel who walked at first. Cabrera came in in the sixth inning for Roberto Alomar to score 14 to 2 at the time. So Cabrera one ball and no strikes to count. Three men on. The ball one strike. Alama similar kind of a pitcher to Mike Bassick the left hand who's been pitching for Cleveland since the uh, third inning. Not a real hard thrower. Sealy six and two thirds innings. But Halama always a winner. Big wins at the minor league level. Player that a lot of teams tried to pick up before the deadline. Shadow left. Martin. No, it's in front of him. Diaz scores and so too does Lofton. Vizquel stopping at second. A two run single for Cabrera. And it is 14 to 5 Seattle. All of those runs charged. Aaron Seeley. An off speed pitch, which you see a lot of front John Halama. Outer half of the plate. Extend those long arms. Go out and get it. The ball was elevated just enough that he could get it out of the infield. All Al Martin could do was come in, pick it up on a hop, and five runs scored tonight by the Cleveland Indians. Eddie Jobinzi. Came in as a pinch hitter for Juan Gonzalez in the sixth inning. And he takes a strike. Tomlinson, he was the guy they traded for Kenny Lofton in the first place. That's a 
Tal Tarbenzi over the years has developed into a uh, very dependable power hitting left handed catcher. In 1991, Kenny Lofton and Dave Rohde were acquired for Eddie Tarbenzi and Willie Blaine, which for a long time afterward looked like one of the most lopsided trades in a long, long time. And Lofton evolved into one of the great leadoff men in the game. Back out of play. Now they're together, teammates here in Cleveland. Robinson traded over from the Cincinnati Reds for Jim Brower. Guy that can come off the bench. He's got some pop, as you mentioned, but it's really in our Diaz, his pitching staff. He's been handed the job as their everyday catcher when he's healthy. Tarbenzi has had some injury problems this year as well. That's a foul. He's uh, be, had become a very dangerous power hitter with the Reds. And has just not been able to, I don't know, there's something about Cleveland that's haunted Tarbenzi. Tarbenzi had 21 homers in a 311 batting average the year before last in Cincinnati. This problem last year. Put him on the shelf for a long while. Shallow center, Mike Cameron, and the inning is over. Three runs for Cleveland. We go to the eighth inning. The Mariners leading 14 to 5. Sunday night baseball from Cleveland. The Mariners 14, the Cleveland 5. Let's go to Alvaro Martin. Well, John, a few weeks ago, Ravi Alomar had noticed something in Kenny Lofton's approach to the plate. He was keeping his hands down. So he actually took him to a video room and said, keep your hands up. That's when you've had success in the past. When you bring them down, you have to bring them up, back, and then forward. It's too much of a waste. You're not catching up to pitches. He had a good run in July after that, but he keeps forgetting. And as you just saw, the reminders are constant. So Roberto Alomar, great second baseman, league's leading hitter, and hitting instructor, at least for one man anyway. Well, you can look at the numbers for Lofton tonight. But Two times that he put the ball in the air on pop ups. That's not his strength. He's got to stay on top of the baseball, keep the baseball out of the air. Now, Martin, the hitter against Mike Bassett. Two and one the count. Martin, the double in the second. That started the four run rally. And if, as far as Cleveland's concerned, that started all of the trouble. It was a ball that probably should have been caught by Kenny Lofton, but he misjudged it. Got a late break on it. And then played the single into a double and then four runs scored in that inning Martin also singled in the third knocking Berba out of the game Martin is two for four strike from Bassett three and two Bassett is giving Cleveland some value right now that could pay off on a win tomorrow or the next day just by the innings he's given the bullpen off tonight what a job he has done just taking one for the team Eighty two pitches now on the night the field and Cordero makes the grab and there's one down. We were talking about the Seattle club, the great, the great run they're having versus the Yankees of three years ago. Jeff Nelson on this team was with that team and we asked him about some of those similar. There's not one guy that I think is a superstar. You have like 25 superstars and everybody on the team contributes. Um, with Seattle, I think Lou tends to play everyone more so there's not the so-called bench players. And he gets everybody in, and then so they're not so stale. With Joe, he basically had the same lineup all the time. But it was uh, it was a different hero every night, and it was the same with New York as, as it is in Seattle here. I think there are considerable similarities in addition to that bullpen between the two ball clubs. Is we just saw Cameron get his third hit of the game. Cameron also with three RBIs. Carlos Guillen will come up now with one out and one on because. You know, 1998, that was the year of McGuire and 70 homers. Sosa, 66. Greg Vaughn, 50. It was the big home run year. The Yankees had this incredible record, and nobody had more than 28 homers in the Yankees ball club. They didn't have any, anybody among the league leaders in RBIs. Batting average, batting titles. I mean, you know, all they did was score a ton of runs and beat everybody. Just real good balance from top to bottom. Pinellas line up with that balance and he also has winning players that he can pull off of his bench from time to time. He 
in, takes a change up, down and away. One ball and one strike. And the Seattle club, I mean, Brett Boone has had a very big year for RBIs. He is leading the league in RBIs. Each year has been a great addition. But, uh, you know, they, they don't have anybody but Jim Tomey type home run numbers. Right there. Juan Gonzalez or Manny Ramirez in the middle of that batting order. Bob Brown. The wind carries it, but nonetheless, Brandon stays with it and makes the play. Two down. 1998, the Yankees threw 110 games, were leading the league in runs, as are the Mariners. Sixth in homers, the Mariners are eighth. First in steals, the Mariners is second. I think the Yankees this year are the one team ahead of them. And an on-base percentage, the Yankees were number one, the Mariners are number two, and very, very similar in all of those categories. Well, you don't bring power to the ballpark with you every single night. Although in 1998, it seemed like McGuire was hitting a home run every night at the ballpark. But you do bring that speed, and they have speed from top to bottom. Luke Pinello, guys that can't run as well as others, he'll put the hit and run on. He'll protect you. He'll do the delayed steal. The guys that can run. They constantly got the green light. Do what you do best. David Bell, the hitter, he's walked single, fly out and popped out, officially one for three. The, uh, <laughs> the Mariners 80 and 30 coming into the game tonight. You have to go back a long, long way into the, the aughts or into World War II to find teams with better records. And of course, the Yankees had a one game better record. 1998 at this point of the year. The Yankees were 81 and 29 and then won eight in a row after that. So at one point they were 89 and 29. On the other hand, don't bet against the Mariners doing that the way they're going right now. I mean they come in here to Cleveland. This is a tough visit for any team. And they're about to make it three in a row over the Cleveland Indians. And the Mariners with a win tonight will have won five in a row. And their record on the road with a win tonight go to 45 and 14. I mean they've been better on the road than they've been at home. And they've been great at home. The Mariners also playing against the best teams in the league have been extraordinary. It really hasn't happened to them play. I mean against the teams that have winning records right now in the American League or National League for that matter in the league play. They are 42 and 16 against those teams. It's been just the opposite for the Cleveland Indians. Under 500 now against teams with 500 or better records. Runner goes, and Brandon throws out Bell to end the inning. One hit, one left. Now to the last of the eighth inning, Jim Tomey, who has homer tonight, the league's leading home run hitter, will get another shot at it. We'll be back. MLB at Home is presented by Scott's, who knows that some of the best games are played in the backyard. Scott's, grow more good. We're in Cleveland. There's the Terminal Tower lit up at night. And uh, Sunday Night Baseball presented by Nextel. The Mariners leading 14 to 5. Here in Cleveland, there's the, uh, the Terrace Restaurant. And a look from inside at the action from the beautiful restaurant here at Jacobs Field. The look from the outside, looking in. Jim Tomey against John Halama. Tomey launched his 35th home run of the year back in the fourth inning. Two run shot. 418 feet was the estimate of the, the distance it carried. And that is a little bit high ball, too. Now, Tomey has a 15 year old nephew named Brandon who was partially paralyzed in a diving accident this summer. The Indians went to Chicago, to Comiskey Park to play. Brandon came out to the ball game, and he asked his uncle Jim, not only if he had just hit him a home run that night, he said, since I'm out here to watch you personally, if he could hit me two home runs. Two. And Jim told him that, that might be a little far-fetched. And then he went out and hit two home runs. Deep into left field. And that one is gone. He's hit two home runs tonight. Number 36. Over the big wall of the opposite field. So for the fans who are still here, Jim Tomey has 
giving them some entertainment. Two more homers for the league's leading home run slugger. His average over 300 now. The first home run he hit in the bottom of the fourth inning, he pulled the baseball. Jim says the reason I'm streaky and I get myself out is because I become too pool conscious. In the next at bat, the bottom of the sixth, he pulled off a breaking ball and struck out. Well, what does he do? He makes an adjustment. He stays within himself. He drives the ball to the opposite field. And because of his tremendous power, not just a single the other way, another home run. And that one got Russell Brandon who home in his last time. 14 to 6 is the score now. Seattle and Brandon will go to first base. From the blimp, here's that home run. Well, Tommy had the two home runs requested by his nephew Brandon. Maybe Brandon's looking in tonight. Maybe Uncle Jim delivered again for Brandon tonight. But Tommy said the thrill for him of the year was hitting those two homers in Chicago and seeing his cousin Brandon in the stands with a big smile on his face. You know there's not a better human being in our game of baseball than Jim Tomey. Constantly over the holidays he'll dress up in Santa. He spends a lot of his own money buying kids for that normally wouldn't receive a lot of gifts during the holidays. Cordova deep into the center and that one is gone. What is it? Too late for all of this. The Cleveland Indians erupting now against Halama. That's their fourth home run of the night. And the game that was 14 to 2 is now 14 to 8. Well, as far as winning the game, yeah, it's probably too late because of the guys Lou Pinella has in his bullpen. But as far as providing excitement for the fans still on hand here tonight, it's not. What a year Cordova is having. And then the spring training happened to make the ball club. He's constantly kept hitting the ball hard. Made the club and all of a sudden now he's still hitting the baseball hard playing a lot hitting over 300 13 homers on the year now well over 50 RBIs. So Marty Cordova with his uh, home run makes it 14 to 8 Brian Price the Mariners pitching coach onto the mound to talk to John Halama as Norm Charlton starts to warm up and the Seattle bullpen. I think the plan was for Halama to come in and just go the rest of the way and give the rest of the bullpenners a night off. But Cleveland got the long ball speaking here in the eighth inning. It's going to look like the old days here. Jacob Field. You just look at all of the teams that won today in baseball that did not score eight runs. And it shows you how important it is for Cleveland to get their starting pitching back together again. A healthy Chuck Finley. Will Cordero. Up the middle. But there is Guillen cutting across. And he makes a very nice pickup on a real bad hop. And he throws out Cordero. So there is one away in the Cleveland eighth inning. Meanwhile, out in L.A. on ESPN2, it's the Cubs and Dodgers for an update. Here's Brent Musburger. So it's the bottom of the eighth. The Dodgers lead the Cubs 2-1, and Gary Sheffield on against Farnsworth. He goes over to first base. Already Farnsworth has been registered at 99 miles an hour in a gun. Sosa will bat in the ninth. Let's go back now to John Miller. We've got some excitement out there in Dodger Stadium. A tight ball game, 2-1 to L.A. The Dodgers Matt Burgess got out of a bases loaded jam in the top of the eighth inning of that game. Giving a Matt Stairs to pop out. Didn't stay within a run. And then Sammy coming up here in the ball game. Here is Anar Diaz following one back against Halama. On one the count. Bartolo Colon on the left side. Now he pitched, as he said, his best game of the year Friday night. But lost to the Mariners, two to one. There's Chuck Finley on the right, whom they are expecting back on Thursday in their series against Minnesota. Up top. To the count. Slowly toward third. Bell was deep. Brilliant effort, acrobatically made, but it proved futile as Diaz easily beat it out. 
he is is one of the better running catchers in baseball and had he not been this would have been a web gym on baseball tonight by David Bell look at the effort look at him coming he doesn't care about whether he gets an error or not I'm gonna do everything I can to try to get the second out here in this inning my pitcher struggling you know there's so many numbers that go up for the Seattle Mariners on the scoreboard but that one area that very seldom gets any movement is under the category of errors is Kenny Lofton over the middle and just past the end so maybe the coaching efforts of Roberto Alomar pay an immediate dividend for Kenny Lofton his second hit of the game. Well that's exactly what Roberto Alomar is talking about. Keep the ball out of the air. Hit it on the line or hit it on the ground. He elevated his hands a little bit. He got a little bit more of the baseball solid. And that brought Lou Pinella out of the dugout. Well Marvin Scout coming up. Norm Charlton coming in. We'll be back. There is Norm Charlton. In the eighth inning. Three runs in. Two men on. And one man out. And the Cleveland, which at one point trailed 14 to 2 going into the seventh, now trailing 14 to 8. They still need a calculator to determine how many hits they need to all of a sudden actually be in the game. But at least it's part of the discussion now. Two men on, Anar Diaz at second base, Kenny Lofton first base. John Alama faced eight hitters. And only got two of them out. He gave up five hits, three runs. He also hit a batter. And is responsible for those two men out there. Vizquel, one for three with a walk. Fastball down and away. There is uh, Nico Vizquel, the young son of Omar Vizquel, who is the bat boy tonight for Cleveland. Watching Dad at work. A bit more intent watching this at bat than the other, did It's a called strike on the outside. Norm Charlton for a, a grizzled, well-traveled veteran. He's got some stuff. This is a great story here, and their pitching coach Brian Price deserves a lot of the credit. Charlton was released by Tampa Bay. That tells you what was going on with his career. Along the right field line, dropping quickly, base hit. Diaz comes around to score. Lofton stops at third. A double for Vizquel. And here in Cleveland, they're starting to get excited. It is 14 to 9, Mariners. And Nico quickly out to grab that bat that had an RBI and a double in it for his dad. Perfectly placed down the right field line and Vizquel doing a terrific job watching what happens to the ball when he sees the right fielder have trouble with it he continues to go into second base there's a veteran bat boy telling him hold on hold on wait till the run scores now go out and grab the piece of wood now things would be a little more promising for Cleveland if Roberto Alomar and Juan Gonzalez and Ellis Brooks were still in the lineup but now here is Cabrera in Alomar's spot with Torbenzi in Gonzalez's spot on deck. But nonetheless, if they get Jim Tomey up in this inning, he could be the tying run of the game. I mean, he'd not do up for a while. <laughs> but if he gets up, and I'm just, you know, thinking ahead here. John Halama, who just had a, a miserable night, two-thirds of an inning. And he's been charged with four runs so far. He has pitched decent out of the bullpen this year, but he's a lot more better suited to be a starting pitcher. And that showed up tonight. He did not have command. One and one to Cabrera. He is one for two since he came into the game. Slider in the dirt, breaking from third for the plate. Lofton, and he is out. Five runs down, and Lofton took a huge gamble. Only a good play if he made it. Boy, you just don't expect to see this out of Kenny Lofton. He hesitated, he hesitated. Stay, stay right there. Charlton doing what he can do. Lampkin with a nice job getting there. 
Often trying to avoid the tag, not able to do that. And just a bad baseball play on the part of a guy that normally does not make mistakes like that. Kenny Lofton, the veteran, and having a bad year, maybe trying a little bit too hard as the, the split finger pitch from Charlton gets the strikeout of Cabrera. And it all comes undone almost as quickly as it got promising. Four runs in, including Tommy and Cordova launching home runs. 14 to 9, Seattle. Veteran lefty on for Cleveland. Mike Bassett in his major league debut. I mean, the line is ugly. Six innings, seven runs allowed by Bassett as we check out Rodriguez's numbers. But, I mean, he, he took one for the club tonight. The bullpen's in good shape for tomorrow's game. Gives him an opportunity to win that ball game. And it was an ugly situation that he was brought in to pitch in. Bases loaded, Mike Cameron at home plate. Maybe got a little bit rattled his first time out, understandable. Settled down after that point. Only a couple of runs. Ed Sprague with a double that hurt him. But gave the Indians an opportunity to get back into this ball game. And with seven runs in the seventh and eighth inning, they're there. Tom Lampkin has doubled home a run, been hit by a pitch, struck out and fly out. One for three officially takes a strike from Rodriguez. 14 to 9, the Mariners lead Cleveland. Well, one thing that happened with Lofton making that ill-advised dash for the plate. Vizquel throws out Lampkin, and there is one away. I mean, they were, you know, a hit or two away from maybe having Pinella get up one of his top relievers, like a, you know, Arthur Rhodes or Jeff Nelson or somebody, which would have been a victory all by itself in a game where they were down by 12 runs at one point with him standing there at third base and a runner at second base a base hit it's a three run lead all of a sudden a safe situation yeah. would have come into play and one of those guys would have been on the mound. I mean, uh, Rhodes probably would have been getting up in anticipation of perhaps facing Jim Tomey in the inning Sasaki might have come on for the ninth inning and uh, Still went on to lose, but you got those guys in there and made them throw some pitches, gave them a workout. Maybe that would have helped out for tomorrow's game. And another guy that wasn't in there in the spot where Cabrera struck out to end the inning, that was originally manned by Robbie Alomar. Gibson has grounded out now. Mark McLemore. McLemore, two for four with a walk. So he's been on base three times tonight, scored two runs, playing second base in place of Brett Boone this evening. Although McLemore said he probably played less second base than any of the other positions that he's played because he didn't be playing every day. He said also it wasn't that big of a problem for him because he came up as a second baseman. Originally. You know, credit to him and the type of person that he is not being up. He thought he was going to be the everyday second baseman until Brett Boone was signed. He thought that job was his. It was not, but McLemore just keeps going. On the count. I asked McLemore about the fact that the Mariners don't seem to get the kind of respect despite their record. You know, people keep talking about hey, the Mariners, it won't be a good season unless they win the World Series. But the Yankees are still the team to beat. So they get to the World Series. It's not the way they were talking about the Yankees in 1998, but McLemore said, he said, well, in 98 they'd already won a World Series. So we need to do that and then we'll get that kind of respect. Jim Tomey coming up second. He's hit two home runs already tonight. Sunday night baseball, Mariners 14, Cleveland 9 to the last of the ninth inning. Coming up on Wednesday night baseball, Jim Tomey and the Indians up against the Minnesota Twins and Doug Mankiewicz at the Metrodome. Big head-to-head -head in the Central Division over on ESPN2 at the same time. Nomar and the Red Sox up against Jason Giambi and the Athletics. 7 Eastern, 4 Pacific on ESPN and ESPN2. There's ball one to Eddie Tomlinson. Jim Tomey on deck. Russell Brannion do up third. Cleveland has hit four homers in the game. Three in the last two innings. They had a three-run seven and a four-run eight. And that is right through the middle. Base hit for Tomlinson. His first of the game. 
And now Tommy, who homered in the fourth to right center and in the eighth down the left field line. Jim Tommy in the fourth against Aaron Seeley. And that was a blast. 418 feet. His 35th of the year. Then in the eighth inning against Halama. The opposite way, number 36. He's the American League's player of the month for July. Two homers tonight. And there's a slider down and away. Well, they don't have the closer up in the Mariner bullpen, but Jeff Nelson, one of their trio of dominant relievers, has started to warm up on a night where they had a 12-run lead. Muscles one on the right. Knuckling the throw back to first, almost doubling up. Eddie Tobinzi was Charles Gibson. Showed a pretty good arm on that play. They just don't take anything for granted. Tommy getting jammed on a good fastball. Inner half of the plate, the target's there. The pitch was in the location. Gibson kind of jockeyed a little bit in the outfield like he wasn't going to be able to get there as soon as he did immediately came up with a strong throw. Ooh. I think he's out. I think, I think he got him. One out Russell Brannion. And the Charlton drops in a call strike. By the way remember how Brunt Musburger in that update from L.A. told us that Sosa would bat in the ninth inning. I'm not going to spoil it. Something happened. Don't click away just yet. All and one the count. Yes, yes. And Brandon now 0 and 2. He has homered and been hit by a pitch since entering the game. Sammy Sosa, though, you have to agree, he's a pretty good player, right? He's, he's really good. And he's kind of stepped up his game. I mean, not all around. Not going to hit 66 homers, but he's become a great player on a very strong club. A winning team and a winning player. Two down now as Brandon is down on strikes. Here's Bill Pito to tell us what happened in L.A. Guess what, John? Brett Musburger has a call on ESPN2. And Sosa over the wall in right. Number 37 on the year. Ties it up at two. All the makings. Man. Now here's Holbeck Cabrera. So Sammy with two down in the ninth inning. Homers against Jeff Shaw to tie that game. Sammy's thinking about another MVP. Okay, got a lot of people thinking about it. Going into left field, going back. Martin looks up it off the scoreboard. Martin plays the carom into third base is Tobinzi. Cordova with a double. Cordova has a four-hit night. Two singles, a homer, now a double. And here is Will Cordero. And that will bring Lou Pinella out of the dugout, and he is going to the bullpen. He said, hey, this has gone far enough. He doesn't look any too happy about it either. Jeff Nelson called into a game that they once led by 12 runs. Will Cordero coming up. We'll be right back. Jacobs Field in Cleveland. The Seattle Mariners 14, the Cleveland Indians 9. Two on, two out in the ninth. Next Sunday, we'll see Maglio Ordonez, Ichiro. It'll be the Chicago White Sox and the Seattle Mariners from Safeco Field in Seattle. 8 Eastern, 7 Central, and 5 Pacific. And we hope you'll tune in with us next Sunday night. There's Jeff Nelson. I mean, that's a great scene, Safeco Field. I mean, the, the crowd is electric and a lot of excitement in that ballpark. Here's Jeff. Now, now look at those numbers. That, is that ridiculous? 46 innings. Actually, we're not even showing his hits allowed, but his batting average against, he's only allowed 18 hits in 46 innings. I've never heard of such a thing. And there's more good numbers we could put up if there were just more room on that board. Nelson's just too big. He takes up too much space. He's been outstanding this year. Coming in with runners on base, leaving them there. He's inherited 31 runners. 28 of them have not scored. Ooh. He's been terrific in the first hitter faced. 49 times that he's come into a ball game. 40 times the oh. first guy he's got now. Well, he and and the same on the second guy and the third guy and the fourth <laughs> guy, right? 
I mean, he leaves them on base and nobody ever gets a hit against him. 46 innings, 18 hits allowed. I mean, that'd be like if you put that into nine inning increments. What's that? He given up two hits, three, three and a half hits every nine innings pitched. You know, Luke Pinella deserves some credit for that as well for bringing him in to face right-handed hitters. His slider just dominates guys from that side of the plate. If it's a left-hander that would have been coming to home, Pinella would have had Arthur Rhodes up. Here's Cordero. Here's that slider down and away for ball one. Now they're singing his praises and they're well earned, but Nelson did give up a run. I mean, it was it scored on a ground out. It was overly impressive. But one of the few he's given up. Fastball. That is up and away. Now, you might be asking, well, how come Charlie Manuel doesn't send up a left handed hitter since he's so mean to the right hand as well? Charlie emptied out his bench when the score was 14 to 2. He gives some of his regulars a, a little bit of a breather and a blowout. Strike in the outside. Two and one the count. The biggest deficit in Major League history that a team overcame to win a game was 12 runs. That was 1911. Detroit, down by 12 to the White Sox, came back to beat them 16 to 15. It's not happened since. That's been 90 years. Three and one. Leonard Diaz, the catcher, is on deck. If actually it's happened twice. Cleveland blew a 12 run lead in 1925 to the Athletics. They lost the game 17 to 15. 1911 to 1925. Three and two to count. It hasn't happened actually since 1925. Although this weekend was the anniversary of the game back in the uh, 20s or the 30s where Cleveland got nine runs in the ninth inning against the Yankees. And two out of nobody else. Giving him a workout. They've got another game against each other tomorrow here in Cleveland. Tell you, man, you'll have to be proud of his ball club. Proud. And Cordero took that pitch just out of the strike zone, but his team has battled back to get the tying run on the on deck circle. And Brian Price on the phone with the bullpen. So here's Anar Diaz, who had a single and a run scored in the seventh, an infield single and a run scored in the eighth. Way outside the ball. So Diaz gets on. Kenny Lofton would become the possible tying run of the game. And the Seattle bullpen is up again. You know how bad Kenny Lofton wants to get to home plate tonight. It was a misplayed fly ball that started the scoring for the Seattle Mariners tonight. It was a bad judgment on a base running play that ended the scoring in the last inning. And Nelson, the one blip on the screen for him this year is that he does walk a lot of people. 29 walks in 46 innings, including the one that he just issued the Cordero, and now Price out to the mound. We've got Sasaki. This is already a rule book save situation. Nelson did not inherit it. It has become a safe situation because of his walk to Cordero. And the safe situation is that the possible time run is either at the plate or on deck. The possible time run at the moment is on deck. Nelson cannot get a save, but Sasaki could. Which would be sort of a a small victory for Cleveland if they got him into the game and that would have down by 20. I don't think Nelson or Sasaki even had their spikes placed up. That's just right. Two and one. Three men on. Tobin Z at third base. Cordova, who's at four hits tonight at second. And Cordero at first. Two down in the ninth inning. 14 to nine. Seattle ahead. And there's ball three. 
Jackson is one pitch out of the strike zone away from bringing the possible tying run to the plate. And Luke Bonelli said, wait a minute. This is, these are like the bad old days. This is the way they used to be with that bullpen here. Three and one to count. Popped out. Foul and out of play. Full count, so now all of the runners can take off. Crazy night at Jacobs Field. It got out of control early for Cleveland as Seattle built a 12 to nothing lead in the third inning. Really helped him out with a good win. He did. I was a little bit surprised the tank was not on there, knowing the tying run was in the on deck circle, not at home plate as of yet. He scores. Cordova scores. Cordero stops at second. And now Kenny Lofton will come up as the possible tying run. It is 14 to 11. A game the Mariners led as late as the seventh inning, 14 to 2. And now Sasaki will get the call. People that started their night here at the ballpark left early when their team fell behind, wishing right now they were still in the ballpark because the fans that are here are on their feet and excited. Kazu Sasaki in for the bullpen. He thought it might be a night off. Lofton coming up. We'll be right back. There is Kazu Sasaki, Daimajin, which means giant man or giant hero of a man that saves the people 300 career saves in both Japan and the United States lifetime when you combine the two 35 saves this year and he has been the Mariners version of Mariano Rivera and Kenny Lofton is coming up against Sasaki it has been a tough night for Lofton the four run second inning began with one out of this drive to center by Martin which Lofton initially misjudged, then played into a double, and then this ill-advised dash from home to the plate in the eighth inning for the final out of that inning with the score 14 to 9. But he gets another chance to do something great to help the Cleveland Indians. Two men out. Two men out. Three hits, all of them in these last three innings when the Indians have scored nine runs. Jeff Nelson faced two hitters, walked one, gave up a two run single to the other. Two 12 pitches when he was in there. Cleveland's hit four home runs tonight. They need one more. Lofton's hit seven. Sasaki has allowed six. I mean, and somewhere tonight, Sasaki may well have checked out of this game. Maybe. Right, 14 to 2 in the seventh inning. Well, it really looked like Jeff Nelson had. That's not the Nelson that we've seen the last four or five years. Base hit, and the bases are loaded. Cordero stops at third, and now Omar Vizquel will come up, and the possible tying runs are all on base, including Lofton, a fast runner at first, who is. The possible tying run. And the key to this comeback might have been the conversation Robbie Alomar had with Kenny Lofton. Because since that conversation, Lofton has gotten two straight hits. He is the tying run on at first base. We know he has speed. And the go-ahead run is at home play. Well, there, you can see Lofton knowing who he is, even though he's had a bad night. Not trying to get out of his normal game. He's not a home run hitter. He hits him occasionally, but usually by accident. A clean single to left. And here is this guy. He's had two hits tonight, including an RBI double to the eighth inning. Oh, no. Changed up on it. He's called the young son of Omar. I'm a little bit surprised that Charles Gibson is so shallow in right field. The ball gets over his 
head, this game will be tied. Too low. Sasaki got a great split finger pitch. That's his out pitch. One ball, one strike to Vizquel, who is one for two in his career against Sasaki. And that bound is open. The top open in the game. Six runs allowed tonight. And three base runners here. He chased the splitter. One and two. Sasaki is so in control of his emotions. This crowd can get as loud as they want. You can bang on that drum all you want. But he has been in these tough spots many, many times before and succeeded in most of them. And again, they were trailing by 12. The fans are still here on their feet, hoping for a ninth inning miracle. They're down to their final strike. And back to the splitter, but this time, Vizquel runs through, not twice. Two and two. He wasn't supposed to have been this way for Lupinetta. Huh? With a 12 run lead in the seventh inning, not for the team of the best record in baseball. Next ball. He tried to sneak one by him, but it was a little bit low. I mean, he snuck it by him, but just a little bit low. Three and two to count. And now they're only running. Lost in the possible time run at first to get those extra few steps. So on a, an extra base hit, he could, he could much more easily score the time run of the game. Cordero, Diaz, and Lofton, there they go. Got a piece of it to stay alive. Colbert Cabrera would be next. In the history of Major League Baseball, a walk-off grand slam, so-called, as we call it on Sports Center, with two down and the team trailing by three, has occurred 13 times. But it also occurred last week in Pittsburgh when Brian Giles did it against Houston. Really well. There go the runners. And he lunges at it, popping it foul out of play, continuing the battle still further with Sasaki. Cordero back to third, Diaz back to second, Lofton back to first. Lofton got a huge jump. I mean, it is critical for Lofton here to get as absolutely as big a jump as he can with this advantage of being able to run. 14 to 11 Mariners. Three on, two out. The runners go. Down the line. It's headed into the corner. One run is in. And it goes through. They have tied the game. Fiscal on the third. It's 14 to 14. Unbelievable. They have come back from a 12-run deficit and tied the game. Now they can go for the win. And they are delirious in downtown Cleveland. You talk about turning moments during the course of the season. This could be one right here. Why were they not guarding the line defensively at first base? Why was Charles Gibson not playing deeper in right field? Hard to understand, but because of both of those things, we're right back where we started with the tie ball game. Now, Sasaki, as Nico Vizquel watches his dad perform as the hero, there's the bluff of a bunt by Cabrera. And it is ball one. Cabrera is up in Roberto Alomar's spot of the order. Kenny Lofton has scored the tying run. And now Sasaki, whose team once led by 12, is trying to send this into extra innings. This guy bluffs down the line from third, trying to distract Sasaki. And he almost got a butt ball there. Third base coach Joel Skinner was screaming at third base umpire Mike Edgar. Eddie 
Tobinsley, who started the inning with a single, is on deck. It has been 76 years since any major league team came from a 12-run deficit to win a game. That happened at the expense of the Cleveland Indians. 2-0 to count. So we have seen an historic game tonight. And not many people who are still living have ever seen anything like this. A team overcoming a 12-run deficit. And Cleveland has done it all in the last three innings of this game. They were down by 12 going into the seventh inning. Kell bluffing down the line from third, trying to distract Sasaki. Three and the count. Bluffing the bunt, taking the strike. Yeah, he did that all on his own. Base coach Joel Skinner gave him the green light. You see something you like? Take a swing at it. Long Chalvin charged with the first two runs of this inning. Jeff Nelson charged with two runs in this inning. Three and one to count. Down to third. David Bell. And a little bit high and wide, but saved over there by Spray. The Cleveland Indians get three in the seventh, four in the eighth, and then, incredibly, five in the ninth inning. And all five of them after two men were down. Omar Vizquel with a three-run triple, and this game goes on. The ESPN Sunday Night Baseball in our 12th year of covering Major League Baseball on Sundays. But we've seen a lot of things over the years. Never anything quite like what we've seen here. A blowout. Both managers removing star players in the late innings. In concession to the Mariners' lopsided victory, now we're in extra innings. It is 14 to 14. Sometime when it's all over, and who knows when that would be, Sports Center will come up. So stay tuned for that. All of the goings on in the day, but much of it would pale in comparison to the unlikely comeback of the Cleveland Indians here tonight, whose ballpark had become friendly for just about everybody in the American League except for the home team lately. Sports Center coming up next followed by baseball tonight. Well Cleveland started looking right at home here at the Jake and now they go to the man who's been there closer most of the year Bob Whitman. That's another thing the Mariners now have already used two of their top relievers and Charlie Manuel is just going to one of his late inning stoppers for the first time. Whitman misses outside to Stan Javier. Javier batting in this spot formerly occupied by Edgar Martinez. Javier came up as a pinch hitter in the seventh. Ed Sprague rather than John Olerud is on deck. And that's high. Now early it was the Mariners. Four runs in the second. Eight runs in the third. Two more in the fifth to lead 14 to two. But then the Mariners so Cleveland get three in the seventh, which excited the fans who were still here. And then four in the eighth, which excited the fans still further and made Luke a little bit nervous. And they ran themselves out of that inning. Lofton being tagged out at home plate. And then Pinella finally forced to use Jeff Nelson to try to get that third out of the ninth. Nelson couldn't do it. He walked one, gave up a two-run single. And then Sasaki. 35 saves, only four blown saves. But tonight he blew the save. He needed only one out to get the save and could not get it. Lofton single. And then Vizquel hit the bases loaded triple. Out here the count of two and two now. Now one man who still is available to Lou Pinella is Brett Boone. Brett Boone given the night off tonight the first night off he's had in two and a half months four 
14 to 14. Cleveland 19 hits, Seattle 16 hits. Crazy game. I mean, it does not make any sense that this could happen to the Seattle Mariners. You can think of some teams that it might happen to, but Seattle is not one of them. And Javier is gone, and, and there you saw the Cleveland third baseman, Brannion, was guarding the line against the extra base hit, and the ball came right to him. As opposed to what happened in the bottom of the ninth when Ed Sprague was not on the line. Skell's ball got past 10 down into the corner. Time enough for Kenny Lofton to score the tying run from first base. You know, to begin with, there was an advantage for Seattle as far as the bullpen was concerned, but that's been taken away now. Wickman's still available, John Rocker's available, Rincon's available down there, Baez is available. But what does Lou Pinella have left? Just Arthur Rhodes and Panny Agua. One ball to no strikes to Ed Spray. Omar Vizcal, who has not been having the kind of a season with the bat that he had been achieving for Cleveland in the past. But tonight he's come up big. Three hits, including an RBI double in that eighth inning, and then the big three run, two out triple in the ninth. There is Arthur Rhodes up in the Seattle bullpen. We've got Tobinzi and Tommy, two left handed hitters with power, to lead off for Cleveland in the last of the tenth inning. Fastball with movement and a cut fastball on the outside, and at 90 miles an hour. Bob Wickman, he lost his job as the closer when they first acquired John Rocker and then got it back. Obed Cabrera. Two down. Meanwhile, an update from L.A. with Bill Pito. Okay, John, Eric Carroll's is up. There's two out. Gary Sheffield winning run on second, and Carroll's to base hit. The line of the Shields has got to charge it. Can't come up with it. Sheffield, the game-winning run. Dodgers win it in 10, back in first by half game in the NL West. Well, we had four pennant contenders on ESPN tonight. The Dodgers and the Cubs of the National League on ESPN2, which featured a dramatic two-out home run by Sammy Sosa to tie that game. They went extra innings, but the Dodgers came back to win it anyway. A rare blown save by Jeff Shaw. Fence coming back for L.A. to pick him up. Al Martin tonight doubled in the second starting a four run rally singled in the third in an eight run rally He's two for five in the game two runs scored and a run batted in two and up. Bob Whitman who started his career with the Yankees he's also been in Milwaukee he's from Wisconsin injured in an accident in his childhood losing a part of his index finger as he says it's almost impossible for him to, to throw a pitch straight. Everything he shows has some kind of natural movement to it. 3 0 to Martin. Mike Cameron is on deck. The Mariners, since the second inning of this game, have scored two runs on five hits. I mean, they've been dormant for a good long while. Swung away and 3 0. Whitman over the play. Two down. Al Martin with an infield hit. Well, Cleveland did everything they possibly could on this play, but the speed of Al Martin just too much to get the out. Tommy came off the bag, fielded it cleanly. Whitman hustling over, but that's the athleticism that Al Martin has always had. He's got speed, he's got power. Just not enough consistent contact to be an everyday player. Look at him turn it on. Now Cameron, who's had three hits tonight, as we see the play at first. Made the call there for John Shulock, the crew chief. Cameron is at two balls off the left field wall. It seems like a whole different game. I mean, really, it is. We've had two different games here tonight. Two different blowouts. Kirby Puckett wasn't even in the Hall of Fame. I mean, he'd been elected, but he hadn't given his speech yet. <laughs> Now Martin used to be a very fine base dealer. He's stolen eight bases so far this year with two down. Is this a spot to 
Look for a chance to steal. Yeah, but this is a rare closer that's difficult to run on. Out of play. One ball, one strike to ten. And as Pinella does a lot of times, I've noticed the last couple of years, in a sacrifice bunt situation, he doesn't put it on right away. He gives his hitter one free swing, one good pitch to take a look at. After that, then he starts to manage a little bit. Possibly the same thing here. He wanted Cameron to have one swing at him. See if you can do some major damage. All right, you didn't get it done. Now I'll take the game into my hands, try to create some movement on the infield. Stepped off the slab first, then bluffed the throw. Now that play coming in from manager Charlie Manuel, wanting to see if Martin will tip his hand that he might be running. It looks like he's going with the control of Whitman. You could afford to call a pitch out. Now he, he didn't get a very big lead. You can see that fast move by Whitman. He was out a little bit more here. There he goes. But right back to Whitman. And the inning is over. So now Tobinzi and then Jim Tomey, who's hit two already tonight. It's tied. ESPN Sunday Night Baseball. The Mariners 14. The Cleveland Indians 14. Last of the 10th. And there's the view of the Jake in downtown Cleveland from the Goodyear blimp. Spirit of Goodyear. Goodyear asks the question, have you checked your tires today? So Lou Pinella has used two of his prized relievers on a night where it seemed sure they would get the night off. Neither one of them had success. Nelson faced two hitters. They both got on base. They both scored. Sasaki came in to get one out to end the game. Couldn't do it until giving up a single and a triple and the game was tied. Now Arthur Rhodes the third jewel in that bullpen is having a spectacular year and Canelo's hoping I'm sure he'll have a little bit more success than the other two guys did. Arthur asked me before the game he said if I get in tonight are you going to take care of me on national TV. Well how can you do anything but take care of him with the terrific numbers and year that he's having. And he is throwing hard. Paniagua is the only non starting pitcher still available in the Seattle bullpen. Here is Tobin's got a slider. And I mean from a guy who throws 97 miles an hour he threw him a slider. And he pulled it foul. 50th appearance of the year for Arthur Rhodes. Also the 50th appearance of the year for Sasaki and Nelson. Lead to Seattle Mariners in that category. Another heartbreaking ball. One ball and one strike. There is Jose Paniagua up in the bullpen. I mean this this is one of those games. I mean it's one in the mid. This happened to the Tampa Bay Devil Rays <laughs> to blow a 12 run lead. That would still be almost impossible. But for it to happen to the team that has had the best record in the major this year, one of the best records of all time this far into the season. And with their great bullpen, that's just truth is stranger than fiction. Tobinzi is down on strikes. He started that ninth inning rally with a single. Now, here comes Jim Tomey. He is the league's leading home run hitter. Tomey has never done well against Arthur Rhodes, however. Trying to think of a fitting way for this ball game to end. Well, this might be a terrific month during the month of July for Tomey. Off to another good start here in August. Long time Cleveland fan favorite. Too low. Not only is Tommy the league's leading home run hitter, but since the first of July, he's also been the league's hottest hitter. Twelve homers, 39 RBIs in the month of July alone. That's the breaking ball for a strike. Got it up though. I don't think Tommy would take that one a second time in the same spot. There's John Rocker up in the bullpen for Cleveland. We saw Paniagua up in the Mariners bullpen. A right-hander. 
Red Sprague waves off Arthur Rhodes, and Rhodes gets those two lefties. Two down. And there's still another lefty coming up, Russell Brandon. No question, this game means a lot more to the Cleveland Indians with Minnesota losing tonight already than it does the Seattle Mariners. Seattle comfortable with a 20 game lead coming into this tonight's affair. They know they're in the postseason. Everything's in order there. But what a lift this would be for Charlie Manuel's team, who has been sputtering the last 10 days. Two down, nobody on. Here's Brandon, big and strong. Has a home run tonight. Slider low for ball one. Brandon has never faced Arthur Rhodes in a game. Here's Omar Vizquel, who drove in four of the runs in the last two innings, including the two out. Bases loaded triple in the ninth to tie the game. Two of them. Marty Cordova, a right handed hitter, is on deck. Arthur Rhodes used to be a hard throwing but wild pitcher when he first came up with Baltimore. And he started. He has harnessed a lot of that power over the years. Ten walks all year. That is a base hit. Everything for Cleveland happens late tonight. The comeback didn't happen until the late innings. The big hit by Vizquel didn't happen until two were out. In fact, the whole five-run rally didn't happen until two were out in the ninth inning. And everything happening with the bottom part of their lineup. As far as the run scored are concerned, Tome scored twice with his two homers. The sixth spot has scored twice. The seventh spot has scored twice. Eighth spot once, and the ninth spot they scored three times for Cleveland. And that's too low to Cordova. Cordova has four hits, two singles early, and then in the eighth inning he hit a two-run homer that made it 14 to five. And in the ninth inning he got the first of the clutch two-out hits that kept the game going, and he doubled. Cordova with four hits that equals his career record. Cordova also, in the little bit of history he's had with Arthur Rhodes, has had some success. Three hits in six career at bats against Rhodes. 500 average. Cleveland with 20 hits for the game now. A possible winning run at first base. in the scoring position. You've got another tough right-handed hitter. Although not one having the kind of a year that Cordova is having. Will Cordero on deck. I mean, Lou Pinello must be thinking that he, he must be thinking that he's dreaming this. This is the things that happened to Lou Pinello when he tried closing games with Jose Mesa. Some of the guys of his past. Where a lot of that gray hair we see with Lou Pinella came from. He's starting to get his color back with the bullpen he's had the last two years until this game tonight. He's just got to be in disbelief. Three and all the count. Came after him with a fastball. Three and one. Now a base hit would end the game, most likely. The guy with the best arm in the outfield for Seattle. Ichiro, maybe the best arm in the league, is no longer in the game. He walked it. Now Cordero. Look at that. Three innings out of the bullpen tonight. Nine earned runs, which is impossible. Oh, and by far the best bullpen in the American League coming into tonight's affair. And against a Cleveland Indian lineup that did not have the regular lineup they started still intact. All star Robbie Alomar not in the game. All star Juan Gonzalez out. Ellis Burks is out. Travis Fryman's out of the ball game. The Charlie Manuel's ball club had no quit in him. They were able to keep Seattle Mariners scoreless the last five innings and now with an opportunity for a victory. Brian Price out to talk to Arthur Rhodes. Mark McLemore, the second baseman, the catcher. 
Lampkin also joined. Well, you know you got a right hander. They're making a switch in the outfield here. They just moved Gibson, the right fielder, to left, and they moved Martin, the left fielder, to right. Well, they're moving the better arm to right to left field. Gibson's got a strong arm. We saw that earlier. Oh man, it came after him and Cordero. He didn't miss that one by much. Yeah, well, and, and that kind of surprises me because with the velocity of Arthur Rhodes being in the upper 90s, you would figure Cordero might be late and the base hit would go to the opposite field. It's not a given that he's going to be able to pull Arthur Rhodes. He was late on that first fastball. Oh, and one. And the sharp breaking ball. One ball, one strike. Cordero with two hits in five. Career at bats against Arthur Rhodes. Brannion, who's a big guy, not the fastest guy, the possible winning run at second base in the tenth inning. And that's foul. One ball and two strikes. Lou Pinella's got the right hander, Jose Peniagua, up and ready to come into the ball game. You got a right handed hitter at home plate, but when the guy on the mound for you is a perfect 6 and 0 on a year, he's not lost a game yet this year. You want to let him make the pitch that determines whether he wins or loses this one. Cleveland down to its final strike, but not nearly the dire. Circumstances that presented themselves in the ninth inning. When Biscal was down to his final strike, and the club was down by three runs. Now it is the Mariners struggling to stay alive in this one. Time taken. Lampkin would like to talk to Arthur Rhodes. This is where the game of baseball has changed. That unwritten rule about having a big lead late in the ball game. You shut your running game down. You don't take the extra base. Well, what is a big lead nowadays? You saw the Pittsburgh Pirates come back with seven runs in the ninth inning to beat the Houston Astros. What we've seen tonight, 12 runs in the last three innings against Seattle. This is a whole new era now. This is an offensive time in the history of baseball. Struck him out. Great pitch by Arthur Rhodes. And we move on to the 11th inning. 14 to 14 from the Jake. Now John Rock into the 11th inning of a 14 to 14 game. And uh, for the Seattle Mariners, Carlos Guillen, David Bell, and Tom Lampkin, you up the last third of the batting order. See Rocker's overall numbers for the year. And uh, he got roughed up a couple of times here after coming to Cleveland, enough so that. He lost the uh, job that he was handed when he first arrived as the closer. Well, the biggest thing that Bobby Cox got frustrated with, with the inconsistency with Rocker as his closer, was the fact that it seemed like almost every at bat was a five or six pitch at bat. Rocker's got a straight fastball, he's got a big breaking slider. It's not like Bob Wickman with the sinking fastball or Mariano Rivera, Jeff Shaw with the cutter. Where they throw a couple of pitches, it gets put in play, and you have easy outs. Seems like everything that Rocker does is, is tough to do. A strike to the inside to Guillen. Guillen, a switch hitter, batting right handed. He is one for five in the game. His one hit was a big one. A two run single back in the third inning that made the score eight to nothing Seattle. Mariners on their way to a 12 to nothing lead in the third inning. 14 to nothing by the fifth, or 14 to two rather by the fifth. One ball, one strike. Now, in those first five innings, the Mariners had 14 runs and 14 hits, but in the last five innings, no runs and three hits. While the Cleveland Indians scored 12 runs and 13 hits in the seventh, eighth, and ninth inning for this game. Pitch. Strike two. The uh, notorious John Rocker, but 
no hitter is ever happy to see oh. John Rucker coming into the game. Only left handers you know that go 98 miles an hour like he does. Diaz steps out, throws him out at first. Man, that was a that was a nasty pitch. Especially when you set it up with the fastball he did on the inside corner. At that point right there, you're not sure what it is. And by the time you commit to it possibly being a fastball, then you see the rotation. You're well out in front and an easy first out for John Rocker. Not David Bell. Bell, like his colleague Gia, facing John Rocker for the first time in his career right here. Again, easy one through there, a breaking ball. Now on deck, instead of Tom Lampkin, Brett Boone, who was the Mariners' home run and RBI leader. He has come out and will apparently will bat for Lampkin. That is going to empty every player Luke Pinella has tonight because Wilson will come in to catch if Boone hits. Danny Agua will probably come out to pitch. And that's it. It's the full complement other than starting pitchers. And of course, uh, Charlie Manuel long ago emptied out his bench. He's got. 12 pitches are only a four man bench, and he's got them up early on. I mean, and, and in that regard, there haven't been a whole lot of managing by either manager because both managers started taking out their star players when it was a blowout. And given their some of their regulars the rest of the night off. Charlie Manuel has uh, made some pitching changes and done a lot of cheerleading. Two and one the count to Bell. Maybe some of that strategy is overrated. I mean, he couldn't put in his lefties or righties or match up or whatever. Or he, he only had what he had. And you see, Brannion came in in the fifth inning, Jobinzi in the sixth inning, Cabrera in the sixth inning, Cordero in the sixth inning. They made the whole comeback without Roberto Alomar, Juan Gonzalez, Ellis Burks, or Travis Ryan. Three and two to David Bell. Well, you can just see once again right here, so many pitches for John Rocker every time out. You just don't know how long he's going to be able to continue to throw with this effort, that kind of velocity. Look at the maximum effort right here. You got a 3 1 count, you got a right hander at home plate. Take a little off, turn it over on the outer half of the plate, get you a ground ball, and you can do it for 10 or 12 here. Three and two to count. David Bell, one out, nobody on. Out of, the, out of play. Now Bell's got a little bit of power. If you uh, make a mistake with him, he can hurt you. He's got 11 home runs. You know, he gets most of those homers against. Young pitchers are pitchers that have patterns. You know, a guy that'll throw a first pitch fastball, or a guy with two strikes is going to throw a breaking ball. You know, he's been in baseball his whole life, he's been passed down through generations in the Bell family, and he knows the game. He did hit a dramatic home run in the ninth inning of the first game after the All Star break at Safeco Field against Rob Men. His club was down. To its final out, and he homered to tie the game in the ninth against them, and they won it in extra inning. Struck him out with the slider. Two down. Rocker has struck out two in a row, and now All Star, the league's leading RBI man, Brett Boone, coming up. Really a gutsy pitch right here on the part of John Rocker, trying to backdoor it to the outside corner. Just off the outer half of the plate, but far too close for David Bell to take. And the big second out here on the top of the 11. Well, you, you knew Brett Boone had to play in a ball game in which Seattle got 17 hits and scored 14 runs. You knew they couldn't do that without it. 14 runs without the least leading RBI man. Brett Boone hitting 329. 
Not just the RBIs, just the home runs. I mean, that batting average is 60 or 70 points where you normally would expect it. Good move. On the outside with a 97 mile an hour fastball. Oh, and one. Now, Boone has seen Rocker in the past. In fact, they were teammates a couple of years back in Atlanta. Boone has only faced him twice in a big league game and is 0 for 2 against him. Dan Wilson has come out on deck. Gibson do up next. Two down, 11 down. Strike two. And the man whose control often deserts him has made two perfect pitches right on the outside corner. That last one at 98 miles an hour. And he just struck out Bell with an 80 mile an hour slider or curveball, whatever it was. Well, we got that one at a cool 100. Just a bit outside. You could hear you could hear John Rocker from upstairs. <laughs> we don't need those microphones down on the field. He was trying to throw that baseball through the catcher, not to him. One and two to boom. Staying hard. And that's a foul. Now Boone said before the game, one of the things he is uh, one of the things he's most proud of is his two strike hitting this year. The best he's ever had in his career. That's what you were talking about. That's uh, also what I'm talking about with how many pitches it takes. It could possibly be a one two three inning. But already 15 pitches. This will be the 16th. That's a lot when you're going to expect the guy to come back and maybe pitch tomorrow night or the night after. Now he tries the slider but misses. Two and two the count. Well, Jennifer Capriati in the women's tournament recently was complaining that Monica Sellis because she grunted so hard on her serves and her volleys that that in and of itself was a distraction and should not be allowed. <laughs> Put some cotton in your ear. Slider got him swinging. Rocker strikes out the side. And again, Cleveland will try and win it. Anar Diaz, Kenny Lofton, and Omar Vizquel coming up. 14 to 14. The game is still going, even though the Indians were dead and buried long ago. Sunday night baseball. The Mariners 14, the Cleveland Indians 14, last of the 11th. Still going in Cleveland. The Reports of the death of the Indians tonight was uh, <laughs> greatly exaggerated, apparently. Jose Paniagua, the new pitcher for the Mariners, the seventh Mariners pitcher of the night. And the only thing pitching coach Brian Price could tell Jose Paniagua is I don't know if you're going to win this game or I don't know if you're going to lose it, but you're going to complete it because you're it. A few other changes in the field now with uh, a new catcher, new second baseman, a new alignment of the outfield behind Paniagua. Amar Diaz, who is three for five, will lead off against Paniagua. Diaz had to feel a little bit left out. He singled and scored in the seventh, did the same in the eighth and the ninth. Did not hit in the tenth. Popped up by Diaz, who had three hits in those three late rounds. One in each inning, but Guillen grabs it, and there is one away. Brett Boone stays in to play second base. After pinch hitting for Lampkin, the catcher. Dan Wilson comes in to catch. Charles Gibson stays in the ball game. 
in right field. But Mark McLemore has moved out to left field from second base. Al Martin leaves the game. That's where Wilson will hit. Here's Kenny Lofton. They brought in Sasaki to face it. With two on and two out in the ninth inning. And Lofton kept the Indians alive with a single to left. And then later scored the tying run on the triple by Vizcal. And he is on base again. It's the fourth time in these late innings that he has reached base. What happened earlier in the ball game? Watch him come underneath that and the easy pop up to the third baseman. The assistant hitting coach for the Cleveland Indians, Robbie Alomar, talking to him about his hand. You've got to stay on top of the baseball. Even though that ball was down, he was able to get on top of it, hit the ball on the line as he has done the last three times. Omar Vizcal. In the first inning tonight, Lofton led off with a single and never even attempted to move to second base. In another spot now, the base stolen could help end this game. But you've got Dan Wilson now behind the plate, who's very strong at throwing out base dealers. But again, as we were told before the game, Lofton rarely runs right now. Only 11 steals all year. He's been thrown out eight times. 2-0 to Vizquel. Vizquel in the seventh inning drew a walk. That was the end of Aaron Seeley, the starter. In the eighth inning, he doubled home a run. That made it 14-9. In the ninth inning, he hit the two-out, two-strike triple that tied the game. Lofton back to first. Just needing a home run for the cycle. Omar Vizquel. A lot of guys that triple is going to be the toughest one to get, but Omar with just one home run on the year. But when Omar hit a triple down by three with two down in the ninth, anything's easy from here. He gets a base hit. Lofton, the whole pitcher has got a real strong arm, charged that one very aggressively. And Omar had been something else as has lost in these late innings. I mean both of them have been on base four times starting with that seventh inning rally. You know it almost looked like the stop sign was on for Kenny Lofton because he never attempted to run. Had he stolen second base this base hit by Omar Vizquel could have ended the ball game but you know in a game of baseball you try to work the percentages in your favor and with 11 stolen bases eight times being caught stealing. That's not a very good percentage if you're managing Charlie Manuel. So now here is Jose Cabrera. Against Jose Paniagua. Freeman has 22 hits. 16 of them in the last four and one four minutes. And one more here could make them a winner. with Robbie Alomar got him on base in his last four at bat and eventually leads to him scoring the winning run for Cleveland. And we have seen history at Jacobs Field tonight. This base hit by Cabrera on a broken bat no less. And Kenny Lofton he needed every bit of his speed to beat this throw by McLemore and he just barely did. He got stepped on for his trouble. 
And we have seen something that had happened only two other times in more than 100 years of Major League Baseball. A team coming from a 12 run deficit to win a game. And the first time in 76 years since it happened against the Cleveland Indians. And they get their revenge 76 years later. Kenny Lofton, who looked like the GOAT more than once tonight. He scored the tying run in the ninth inning and he scores the winning run in the 11th inning. And he'd been around a long time, but he has not had that much joy in a ball field, I think, in a long, long time. The Cleveland Indians had lost six of seven and were buried in this one, but incredibly, they have come back to win it.